From TMP to TTNG For sure the care in those tired meme jeans Hella can sell in the promise ring Sunny day real estate and rights this spring Prince Twinkle Daddy's help keep the dream alive I constantly thank God for Algernon and Remo Christie front drive Mineral snowing high tide hotel a year and more Rio Limo only consists of the DC emotive hardcore I'm just waiting on Kyle to do the intro. All right, hold on. Let me get some food out of my mouth. Hell yeah. All right, episode 47 of the E-Word. Quarantine episode number two. Uh, 100 best emo songs of all time, part two. This is Kyle and Madison, joined by Ellie. Ellie, Austin, how's it going? Uh, Texas is ranked 49th in the country for coronavirus preparedness. Um <laughs> And they count they count Washington D.C. as a territory, so we're above <laughs> Mississippi and Wyoming. So we are the third worst prepared state for everything that's going on, and it kind of just seems like everyone outside is going like business as usual. A lot of businesses shut down, uh, but everyone's just still going out with nary a care in the world. But I still feel like emotionally distanced from everyone when i when i go outside like i don't even want to talk to someone uh not because i'm afraid of like the virus but because it feels wrong on a moral level to talk to people when virus is going around um that's how i'm doing and we've got collins from closure back up there in syracuse uh earth crisisville how's it going collins <laughs> uh, thanks for that um it's going well um <laughs> I like that Earth Crisisville. It's going. It's going. Syracuse is. Uh, it's the same. All right. It's the... <laughs> <laughs> There's not nothing happens here anyway. It's the same. All right. All right. And then our California correspondent Seth, what's going on? Not much. Just you know, staying inside. Uh, the the la the next Repeater Records release, the uh, U and I discography got delayed at the plant because they're closing down for about half a month at the moment so we'll see when that actually gets put out but we're gonna we're gonna send everybody the uh the remastered tracks who uh who ordered it for now from from what i heard was that record labels have not yet been impacted uh like sales haven't stopped because you could still do mail order and stuff are you seeing that or are you seeing the opposite um well the no i mean the sales of the sales have been fine it's just the the production that's yeah. now yeah been impacted so yeah that's caught up well yeah we'll see about when that it's worked out so we're just waiting Ooh. <clears throat> all right so we're picking up at number 50 on this vulture 100 greatest emo songs of all time list we were talking a little bit about feedback which has been little to none uh on our uh 100 through 51 has anyone heard from the writers about our episode? I have heard dri dribs and drabs, uh, but everyone, when, because the episode kind of came out and then almost immediately afterwards, America kind of plunged into this nightmare. Yeah. Uh, and so everyone was just like, yeah, I listen, I listen to the latest E word. Can I vent to you about the horrible shit that's happening? <laughs> Yeah, but now we're giving them the content that they want so they can listen in quarantine. 
God, Axe to Grind is putting out like five extra episodes a week or some shit. <laughs> my phone literally went into you have no more room on your phone, and I deleted the Axe to Grind episodes, and it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> so we're picking up at number 50, which is uh, uh, going to be a controversial one. Bright Eyes, The Calendar Hung Itself uh, from Fevers and Mirrors. My favorite Bright Eyes song from this record. Uh, but the thing is... Is Bright Eyes emo? Are they putting this on here for the discussion point? Are they putting it on here because Bright Eyes is coming back this year? I I feel like Bright Eyes was a was a band that a lot of emo kids liked, but there was kind of an understanding that they weren't really emo as such. Because a lot of emo kids liked them, but they were also very popular with like uh, the same type of people who effusively sorry who were super excited about uh pavement reissues that kind of uh dot com indie rock audience we've we we have broken this down before and bright eyes is sad bright eyes is cathartic but it doesn't come from any kind of punk or hardcore scene yeah which is it was uh purposely trying to distance itself from that the whole project bright eyes was trying to distance itself from punk and like you know that sort of diy scene and it's another this is another like song that was just put on there as i don't i don't know why <laughs> it was just so-, <laughs> so you could put connor over's picture in the graphic to go along with the article yeah sure exactly i mean if you if they'd chosen a commander venus song and been like he Connor went on to be in Bright Eyes. Like that would that one, yeah, that make more sense. sense. But it's just not. It, like Bright Eyes was just not emo and not even not even emo adjacent at that point. Like I, it was, I don't know. It, it's another it's another band that's like the lyrics are emotive and it is you know sad and evokes feelings, but it's not not an emo song. Yeah, I could see uh, maybe the, like the very very early stuff, like like the water cassette being considered emo adjacent because it was like, oh, here's this like singer songwriter stuff made by someone who is related to a lot of these like kind of Omaha post hardcore bands. But as Ian Cohen writes here in this write up, Oberst was making a protracted effort to a shoe punk to formulate a kind of Nebraskan answer to Elephant Six. And I can't think of any indie rock movement in the last 20 years that was aggressive, like as aggressively anti-punk it sonically than Elephant Six. I did see I did see Bright Eyes in an apartment in uh, Santa Cruz on his first tour, and he oh. passed out after three songs. Couldn't play. So that was that was kind of punk, but. <laughs> Are we just saying that alcoholism equals punk now? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> an apartment an apartment show plus alcoholism. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, in that case. <laughs> well, like, while this album was coming out, or, like, the first two big ones or whatever, were people tacking emo in, like, the headlines for Bright Eyes? No. No. It was just singer-songwriter. No. Yeah. Also, my favorite song from this album is uh, Halai, 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 Halai. Oh, yeah, me too. It's a good song. Yeah, love that song to death. All right. Um, 49. <laughs> we're moving on to 49. Back, back to the world that we know. Um, the world is a beautiful place, and I am no longer afraid to die. January 10th, 2014. This is probably the, the best song on Harmlessness, right? Mm, yeah. I mean... It's the big one. It's up there. Top... Yeah, generally, uh, I'm not as much a fan of them post whenever, if ever. But yeah, this is the same thing, actually. Yeah, but this song, like, I I do think both because of like its narrative and musical ambitiousness, um, has always been kind of a standout to me. And you could probably write like like a feminist thesis uh, about this song, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I am a fan. I don't know if I would put this at 49 above some of the other more classic World Is songs. I would prefer maybe to have, like, Getting Sodas in in this spot. 
I think the thing is, like, I think Harmlessness became, like, their album. That's really weird. I think that's I a journalist care. take. Kind of the way that, like, journalists have made goodness, like, the Hotelier album, mm-hmm. but... Yeah, yeah. For everyone else, Home is clearly the Hotelier album. Yeah. <laughs> because, to me, Whenever If Ever is the World Is record, but do you think it's, like entirely a journalist pushed narrative because i do think harmlessness actually has become a huge fan favorite and a lot of people are are like especially when like always foreign came out people were like man i wish they sounded like harmlessness again Mm -hmm. yeah i I think that harmlessness had more um more of a a wider reach yeah so it was a lot of people's like it was a lot of people's like first first listen yeah, that yeah. was the first thing I listened to by them. It was the first thing I remember hearing about um, The World is a Beautiful Place was, it, yeah, it was like 2015. Yeah, that was like the first time I heard about them was when that record came out. So I think it makes, I mean, I, I understand why they would pick something off of it. That makes sense because whenever if ever really kind of blew the doors off this whole emo revival era in, a, in like a commercial sense. Um, and harmlessness like musically is pushing past those boundaries um but i think probably because of the exposure that they had already gained and the fact that now music journalists were okay with saying that they loved the world is a beautiful place um this album really like ascended if that makes sense yeah and uh, this song really helped with that too because it's semi for a world is song it's not as adventurous in song structure and stuff but like the actual content behind the song is fucking fascinating and i yeah. and i remember like getting so much to chew on when the single premiered on npr back in the day oh that's five years that's ago. right but i was like oh wow seeing the world is in npr and the song is amazing and it is like this song about someone who has been killing bus drivers <laughs> There's uh there's someone on our emo uh whose handle is Diana the Hunter. Uh they're kind of a dick, but <laughs> I mean that just Look. describes all of our emo though. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, it's a cool it, it, it's a really cool handle nonetheless. Um but yeah. I I guess I guess overall my opinion is I think I would rather see an earlier the world is song here, but uh I, I understand why they would pick this song. Um, not necessarily a material perspective, but more of like an idea-based perspective. I think it's rare that you see emo songs that try and tackle these concepts, uh, especially with like the size of platform that the world is, has. So I can't really complain about this pick like too much in that regard. <laughs> I'm looking up the 30 best emo albums that uh, Spin did a few years ago, and Harmlessness was number seven. <laughs> and Whenever, Wild. if ever, was number two. Okay. Uh, that's insane. <laughs> but once, once, again, I, <laughs> once again, putting a. Put it, you, you shouldn't be able to put someone on there twice. And <laughs> secondly, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think the more fucked up thing is that they put out Sorority Noise, You're Not As Blank As You Think, like, a few months after that album came out at number 10. Yeah. <laughs> that I mean, the, very poorly. Yeah. <laughs> I remember we had to, like, cut it from, like, emo, just the, the album of the month voting, because all that camp stuff came out, like, not long after that record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that stuff had been floating around forever though like yeah yeah if you true. if you had been touring i think that you had known or somebody had told had mentioned something about that but talking about that camp situation also uh forces us to open up the whole can of worms where the world is is concerned and i don't think we have time for that no. <laughs> 48 at the drive-in transatlantic foe uh is this the At The Drive-In song? Is this yeah. even the At The Drive-In song from In Casino Out? No, it's it's not. It's not the song from... It's. I mean, it should have been Initiation, but... Uh, initiation? I would have gone with Napoleon Solo. 
They're both both good choices. I, I I really do. I mean, I I don't I don't think Transatlantic Foe should have been the choice. I yeah, especially off of In Casino Out. <laughs> it it feels to me like maybe In Casino Out was chosen because Relationship of Command is much more tied to post hardcore mm-hmm. more broadly than to emo. Um, and if you do like a pre Relationship of Command song, you can kind of make the case that at the drive-in uh is emo but i still don't think that i kind of put them in the emo box personally oh they they Um, yeah they were absolutely in very very much in the scene like it was they the first time i saw them was with they were touring with jay june and i the they were they were yeah it was they came up in the emo scene and it was uh yeah very uh very much involved so that was I, uh, it's a solid choice for I mean at the driving is a solid choice for this list but transatlantic foe is not a solid choice for the song I mean yeah that that does make perfect sense um but in a historical context do you think at the driving is still uh as tied to to emo as it may as they may have been when they were coming up no I mean I don't even think relationship of command was I, I relationship of command was the production on that record is just nasty and not in a good way. And oh no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, did Ross Robinson do the production on that one? I can't remember. I I didn't. I just I didn't I, like it. So I think it was Ross Robinson because uh, he also did the production on "Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Silence" by Glassjaw. I think oh, yeah. that Glass- similarly yeah. nasty, similarly <laughs> nasty record. Just ugh. I think that record plus Relationship Command, and then. Uh, a little bit after stuff like Tell All Your Friends and Burn Piano Island Burn kind of was like post-hardcore peeking out of the DIY scene and making inroads into the mainstream and eventually that led to like Dance Gavin Dance and Chiodos. So I think maybe that like that that whole premise being in my mind is kind of what's separating At The Driving from Emo in my head. But I do know for for a fact that you Seth is right. They like absolutely came up in that scene. But yeah, just just the wrong song pick, personally. Yeah, I mean Omar Rodriguez Lopez had a Dahlia seed tattoo. It's you know That's so sick. They have they've got cred. <laughs> I don't think anyone's disputing that they have cred. Um <laughs> The only per- the only person that I would dispute has cred is Beto O'Rourke. What? I saw that coming. <laughs> uh, Forty seven, just to Brazil, Chinatown. Jawbreaker is absolutely going to be on this list later on. At least they did not do the thing where they put the follow up band higher than the definitive band, uh, mm-hmm. like like they did with like Knapsack. Yeah, they uh, they they wouldn't have been able to get away with that. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, mostly because Jawbreaker fans are uh, a, a dis- pathologically disturbing breed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do, do, uh, does anyone here share the take? This is not my take, but I've heard I've heard it said a lot that just Brazil is better than Jawbreaker. <laughs> no. I've heard it in like a preference type of way. Not that they're better. It's just like what I want to listen to now is just to Brazil and not Jawbreaker because I've worn out those records or I'm a certain age or something. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I've uh, listened to more just Brazil than I have Jawbreaker. I mean, I don't really have an opinion of who's better or not. I think that's pretty subjective. But I think to me, it's more just that Jawbreaker has more perfect records that I go back to all the time. And Just Brazil only has two that I go back to all the time. Uh, Orange Rhyming Dictionary and Perfecting Loneliness. But also, I think that uh, Just Brazil is a lot sleeker and more considered than Jawbreaker. And maybe I just kind of miss the kind of like dirtbag explosiveness, you know? Yeah, it was it was a bit of a shock when this record came out. A shock in 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 what sense? It just everyone was expecting Jawbreaker Part Two. Mm. Yeah. Um. I in retrospect, I don't see Blake doing that, 
but at the time, I could see that that would probably would have been the expectation. Yeah, it, it definitely was. And there was there there was a uh, people weren't mad, but they were, you know, confused a little. Uh, my favorite take that I see old people talk about is um, lots of lots of old '90s heads uh, actually <laughs> genuinely jawbreaker. <laughs> Not even because of Dear You, they just like hate all jawbreaker except maybe like the pre-unfun singles <laughs> <laughs> one of the sarah kirsch bands uh recorded basically like a jawbreaker diss track um, yeah that was torches to realm yes yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> um <laughs> and someone posted it in the 90s hardcore facebook group and they were like oh yeah i always liked feel more than jawbreaker which is like fair but it just seems weird to me uh, that you can like discount the impact that Jawbreaker had. That uh, feels like historically revisionist. Yeah, and also the song choice. I mean, it, it, it's a it, it's a Chinatown's a good choice, but um, I would have gone for I I, I would have gone with I typed for Miles or Sweet Avenue. Sweet Avenue for yeah. me. Those are those are both good picks, but I I actually am okay with uh, Chinatown. Yes. Oh, yeah. I would I would say Sweet Avenue like was like would be like my like pick if I had to pick one. Oh shit! I guess that's the hit. <laughs> that's the first song that I listened to by them though. So at the same time, like it popped up in one of those like um like timeline through Midwest emo or something like that like playlists on Spotify. So it just kind of was happened to be the one that I listened to first. How many songs on this list do you think a lot of people's first exposure was through, like, some, like, remember those old Amazon lists that were like, oh, here's your introduction to emo, or here's yeah. your introduction to the list manias. Yeah, I would yeah, say, yeah. like, the, in the top 50, like, almost every single one. Yeah. Like, just from browsing the top. I don't know about the bottom 50, because I wasn't like honestly as familiar with a lot of them but like looking at the top 50 like most of these like were the first songs that i listened to by the each band and so i would say like a hefty majority of them would be the first ones um an exception to that i think would be 46 embrace no more pain this is absolutely not the first embrace song that i heard i'm pretty sure the first embrace song that i heard was money i think the same thing for me actually I think said gun was mine. Yeah. Um, does anyone remember, uh, Seth, you probably remember this, but um, I'm pretty sure Ebullition did that, like, Embrace covers comp. It was not Ebullition. That was... Um, no, it wasn't. Uh, I, but I'm thinking of World of Greed, right? Yeah, where you're thinking of World of Greed. That was not Ebullition. But, yeah, that's a that comp is great. I, it, like, really, really good. <laughs> well, uh, what lady am I thinking of then? What's that? What, what label was it then? Um, what's it? I, I, Land Agreed, World of Need. I'm looking it up on Spotify. Trust Kill. It was yeah, Trust. Trust Kill. That was it. Yeah, not fair. At Trust Kill. Right. <laughs> that's what I was. That's where my my mind was going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. But the yes, the the reason that money was the first uh, Embrace song I ever heard is because Lifetime covered money on this comp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you're right. This is a fucking fantastic comp. Holy shit! Yes, real good. <laughs> the rancid cover. <laughs> yes, uh, a veil covering said gun. Um, which uh, that also reminds me of uh, the food not bombs benefit comp that Inchworm did, which was yeah. also really really good. Um, Embrace for me, one of the most important bands that ever you know happened in my life. I got a I got a cassette tape from a friend that had falling forward on one side and embrace on the other. And that was, Oh, know, that's so sick. When I was 16 and then it's, you know, been, that's changed everything. Yeah. To me, embrace probably is musically the best of the revolution summer fans. I, I just think like the way, like the guitar is, is sculpted is something really, really special. It sounds like REM trying to go hardcore. That makes sense. <laughs> and and every song, every song on every song on that album is amazing and could have been on this list. So I, yeah. I can't really can't really uh, argue that that record is is one of the 
the high points of my musical awakening. Fuck yeah. Yeah, no, great record, great band. Um, and immediately followed by 45 <laughs> My Chemical Romance. I'm out of <laughs> there's two, this. There's two My Chem songs on this list. Uh, neither of them, I I think, are the best My Chem songs, but they are probably like the most important my chem songs uh as far as like how the how the mainstream perception of emo uh changed or evolved uh in the early to mid 2000s i think i'm not okay is kind of my chem's attempt at doing like uh bleed american era jimmy world i can hear it for sure i get it i get what you're saying uh, don't, also, don't get me wrong. Like this is a fucking fantastic song. Even uh, even um, like within Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge, I think the song is kind of like a little bit out of step. It is a lot popular and more anthemic, and has like a more conventional structure than. I mean, that's just what Mike Hem does on almost well, at least for Black Parade and um, and for Three Cheers. Like they always had those those one or two songs that were kind of like out of nowhere like on like black parade it was teenagers why was teenagers on black parade I'll, i still don't know especially after listening to the b-sides where there were a lot of other demos that arguably would have fit way more um oh yeah mm-hmm. yeah kill all your friends probably would have slotted in like pretty why, perfectly teenagers why is are... why is my way through home is you not on the black parade <laughs> like that's insane to me. Like I, I listen, I still listen to that song more regularly than it, regularly than I listen to teenagers. But in terms of three cheers, yeah, I'm not okay. It definitely sticks out sonically, but you can't argue that it's the song from that record. I mean, you could say Helena, which like obviously spoiler alert, the list did. But I think that everyone's first exposure to my chem was I'm not okay. That music video was just iconic. Like it's just. It's I was going to say. I- I think the music video was actually extremely important for this band. Um, yeah, it fit their entire like the, the the entire premise of the band was was that music video essentially. Like that's what they, you know, kind of set out and to to talk about was the, like the misfit kids and you know do you and all that stuff. And that's like that music video kind of pretty, you know, summarized that pretty well. So how many My Chem fans who were like eight years old when the song came out eventually watched like Rushmore and were like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are, there are kids like, so I played, <clears throat> we played like this um, like emo night thing, which I will never do again, by the way. That's like an entire, entirely different podcast episode <laughs> as to why I will never play another emo night. But we were we were playing it and there were there was each each band had to like apparently cover a band and we i don't even remember i don't even remember like hitting like getting up or hitting up the the promoter about the show but i just was like scrolling through facebook one day and i happened to see that we were playing an american football cover set and oh I was my like, god <laughs> i was like i was like oh what like like because we're the only we're like the only band that like has ever played in an open tuning, therefore we must sound exactly like American football. I was like, I can't learn like in the sets were like an hour. I'm like, I can't learn like ten American football songs in like a month. That's insane. They're like insane. So like they're 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 like say what you want about American football in terms of you know being emo for casuals or whatever. But I mean I I mean it's it's pretty mathy. Like I mean I I don't know where the tabs are. So anyway, but there was a band that was supposed to do my chem. Long story short, for some reason, I ended up on stage with the band doing vocals for the My Camp set. I don't know how or why it wasn't planned, but it was. And I'm just, like, looking out, and there's, like, a lot of kids there. And I'm looking out, and there's these, like, little, like, girls. It reminded me of, like, when I went to a My Camp show, like, back when they were, like, you know, in, in, the, in the heyday, I guess, in the prime. And there were, like, these little girls that were, like, 12, 13, with skull face paint, and the fingerless gloves and like and i was just like holy fuck this is insane and i like you know like their parents were there with them and i'm like this is like some really weird like flashback that i didn't i wasn't ready for tonight i was like talking to some of the parents afterward and i'm like 
I'm like, it's so cool. You know, you're taking your kid out to the show, you know, like really appreciate it. You know, your help supporting bands and then, you know, it's fun for them. And like, this is really cool that because back, you know, before that, like or during that time, my chem wasn't making a comeback, obviously, um, or we didn't we didn't know for a fact, I guess. And so I was like, how, you know, how old, how old is, how old are your kids? And she's like, oh, you know, the one is 12 and the other one is 11. And I'm like, so they weren't even alive. <laughs> like my chem was a band, <laughs> like, which is insane. So like they, they, they have, they have that reach that like, that just transcends time. Like there are still kids to this day that are like 12 that, that wear skull makeup to school and like paint their eyes, you know, pink and try to look like Frank from three cheers like it's it's crazy i feel like uh sometime after like 2013 kind of like the scene aesthetic became the province of you know kind of midwest or rural kids who were just very very late on the bandwagon but my chem kind of flipped the flipped the polarity on it because even though they broke up in 2013 there's still new kids getting into my chemical romance every single fucking day even like circa 2018, when like uh, DIY started going through that scene aesthetic revival with all the bands who semi ironically appropriated like Drop Dead Gorgeous um, and 18 Visions aesthetic, I, st I still think that you could go to like a Scrams show and a band could cover My Chemical Romance and people would unashamedly sing along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? no, I definitely agree. I, I think that. Um... I don't know if I said it last time because I know we like kind of discussed my chem last time, or at least I thought we did. But I really think they're like they were like one of the last big like rock and roll bands to ever like exist as as, oh, as what we think yeah. of them. You know what I mean? Like like absolutely. I don't think I don't think that there will be another band that comes around and, and does what they did like in terms of just like rock and roll. Because like, can you really pin pin them down as a genre? I hate when people like oh my. My chem isn't real emo. It's like, well, if you listen to Bullets, because like that's pretty close in my opinion. Like, but it yeah. doesn't matter because they transcend. And it sounds weird, but I obviously I love the band. Obviously, Ellie knows. Like we've discussed My Chem in depth, but um, yeah, I I think that My Chem like transcends genre. They have something for everybody. You, you, it doesn't matter what kind of music you like. Like they have a record for you. They have a song for you. They have an era probably for you. You know, if you're into this kind of music. So I think it's so cool what they did, and I I just I truly think that they were the last like real rock and roll band, at least in my at least in my mind. I don't know if I'd say last real rock and roll band, but they definitely are probably the last rock stars. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Yeah, in the traditional sense. Yeah, like absolutely. After the era of my chem, uh, I think hip hop kind of took over the pro province of like what rock star meant in the zeitgeist, and it's it's uh, evolving into something different, and now instead of being like a rock star you're like an influencer <laughs> but my, my chem definitely were like the the last of of an era who knows it's, it all circles back eventually like you know we go through like you know kind of this the cycle repeats itself so i mean now you see like you know machine gun kelly doing like a, a record with travis barker and it's like it's like is it going to come back like are, are we going to try to circle back to like this like rock and roll sort of you know era or what well, like i think the thing is I that think... like things are getting too segmented so like not everyone gets on board just for my chemical or for a band like my chemical romance like people are like like pop punk bands like everyone has their preference within pop punk now like not everyone's like neck yeah. deep. like people are like fuck neck deep i love state champs so like they don't yeah i think that's just accessibility <laughs> that's that statement means like nothing to me like those <laughs> exactly the same um but uh i think the thing about my chem and i'm not mad at all that they're on this list because i think of all the emo pop bands they probably represent like one of the clearest through lines back to boat of hardcore like especially on on three cheers it doesn't sound necessarily like emo but it does sound like emotive rock music with octave chords and influence from hardcore and you can kind of see where people were coming from when they when they labeled that band emo more so than a band like cute is what we aim for per se yeah absolutely um, see but then they didn't really embrace the emo label too which is like a whole other thing 
Like, yeah, because uh, their influences were so varied. They were into like T Rex and Brit pop, and I mean I, Ray was into like you know like uh, like Metallica and yeah you know like that hair metal like hair metal and then the, that you know Metallica type metal, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, they learned to scream by like playing along to At the Gates records. Yeah. Um, so it 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 just was like this melange of a shit ton of influences. Um, and I think that was a double-edged sword for them when it came to credibility. Um, but it, it is what helped them become like a mainstream phenomenon. Because I think you need to have a lot of varied influences and synthesize them properly to sound unique enough to cross over. Well, absolutely. I think that like the yeah. biggest issue with a lot of bands is that they, they're like, okay, we're going to be a Midwest emo band. So we need to sound like every other Midwest emo band. And like, it just kind of ends up sounding contrived. And, um, I mean, that's an issue. Why, why would I listen to your band when I can go listen to another one that's, that I already know. Mm -hmm. So I think to have that kind of like myriad of influences that my chem had was just like, it's, it's just kind of, you know, it, it, it speaks for itself. The sound is just like, you can't really pin it. You can't really pin any era. And I honestly have been listening to Danger Days a lot recently. And Danger Days is fucking sick. I will say. A lot of people had a lot of mixed, mixed thoughts about it. But I think Danger Days is pretty good. On that subject, let's move on to 44. <laughs> on the real though, isn't it fucking wild that um, we're all like quote unquote real emo fans, but we just spent like 10, 15 minutes talking about My Chemical Romance and did, didn't I talk shit learned, about them once. <laughs> I just learned more. I just learned more about My Chemical Romance in that last 10 minutes than I knew for years. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> um, I think when we get to their later placement, we should talk about them again and get more of Seth's take. But in the interest <laughs> of time, uh, we should move on. 44, Dessa Parecidos, the happiest place on earth. Dessa is proof on this list that they did not need to put Bright Eyes on this list. Like yeah. if they put if they put Dessa here, they totally could have put Commander Venus here. Yeah, uh, exactly. yeah. Exactly. And, thought of it. Like Bright Eyes, did, Bright Eyes did not need to be included because Dessa Parecidos is is way more representative of you know what emo emo was at the time and is now or whatever than bright eyes ever was i don't nina nina did it again she, she <laughs> nina did, did it right, again she did the right thing again <laughs> hell yeah um this is like a a perfect fucking record um i think both dessa records are perfect to me this kind of speaks to the fact that people don't often realize like how political a lot of early emo was um like uh, bands like admiral you know or even moss icon in a really like elliptical roundabout way uh not not even just making the political personal and the personal political but you know having like a cohesive political message and i think in this in, in this time in American culture, uh, it was genuinely subversive to to be critical of George W. Bush. I think as it stretched into like the mid to late 2000s, it became much more commonplace. But those several months after 9-11, I think you were actually making like somewhat of a dangerous statement by being so critical of George W. Bush and... Uh, his response to 9-11 because if, if you look at like the polls uh the support for the war was extremely high among everybody yeah it was uh, a dark, dark time yeah and i i feel weird kind of talking about this like i wasn't five at the time um, <laughs> but, but my my birthday is 9-11 so I have like a like a strange attachment to to that time in American history, and I do like to do a lot of research, and I do um, like to think about like kind of the the political uh, uh, domino effect that that had, and I think you can trace like a lot of what's going wrong right now back to the horrific and honestly disgusting practices of the Bush administration. And I personally 
even go so far as to say I think the Bush administration was genuinely worse and more destructive for America than the Trump administration has been so far. Yeah, I'm really glad to see this the song here. <laughs> that the, I know what that what I said had nothing to do with the song, really. <laughs> but but you had something yeah. to say. <laughs> I did. I I I I had a soapbox and I needed to put it somewhere. So I wrote it. Thanks, I, thanks pal. I wrote, I wrote a D and D themed concept album about that. So I'm I'm with you. I'll that's a that. sentence that's never been said before. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all riff on Dessa and 911. I'm going to go get uh, another can of your. I like this record a lot. I think I think this one, like though it's about the politics of the uh, nearly 20 years ago, it's still very relevant and like it's a timeless record in my opinion. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. You can put it on now and it's dealing with kind of the same bullshit. Yeah. I I think I've said this on the podcast before, but I do really think that the the second like comeback that's a record is like extremely strong a payola yeah yeah that's a that's a fucking phenomenal record are we are we finally done with that whole like conservatism is the new punk rock bullshit people finally see through that grift i hope so uh being pro authoritarianism and pro nationalism i think is potentially the least punk thing possible mm -hmm. like, yeah didn't, i don't think that i don't think that took off <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> So it's, um, it's been like about 40 minutes of recording these songs and we got through like four of them or five of them. God so damn it. we're doing it again. We're yeah. doing Let's it hustle. Again. Let's hustle. Let's hustle for All sure. Right. Uh, 43 Thursday, Understanding in a Car Crash. Yeah, this is the Thursday song. This is the Thursday record. I used to not think that Thursday belonged to the emo bucket, but time has changed my opinion on that. Like, Oh man, this is, this is it essential and this is yeah. this track is banger this yeah. is it's really good stuff i'm surprised yeah. because they've done so many of these uh like big bands but uh chose weird songs and this one is just like they're it's perfect yeah it's perfect and yes i'm surprised that they did it kind of conventionally i think that it's uh obviously i agree with everybody else but I just love Jeff Rickley's voice. It's so distinctive. And I think that's like, I think it's really like whenever you hear like Jeff Rickley sing, you're like, yeah, that's, that's Jeff Rickley. So mm -hmm. like, it was one of those songs that I listened to a bunch, like when I was a kid and didn't really know like what it was. Cause it was like, I was young and whatever. And it was just on some random YouTube video. You're like, Oh, what is that song? But I would always recognize like, Oh, that's that one band that I know I like. And that was because of Jeff Rickley's voice. I think they're they're such a good band. Tom Tom Schlatter, Tom Schlatter from you and I did the yes uh, yes did yes. the screams on did the screams on that song too. It's funny that you consider Jeff Rickley to have such a definitive voice, and you're not wrong. But it's it's just funny because prior to Thursday, uh, Jeff would, like try out for bands, and they'd be like, "You can't sing." Sorry. <laughs> I think that having a unique voice is way more interesting in a band. Think about all your favorite bands. All the singers have these, like, you know, the ones that really transcend and really make a difference and really, like, stand out. All the singers are, their voices may not be, like, conventionally good, but they're different. Like, Gerard yeah. Way's voice, I think he can be conventionally a good singer. His voice is definitely, definitely, like, very interesting. Davey Havoc's voice, you can pick it out of a lineup anywhere. You know, it's like... Anything All right, that's the uh, that's the my chem and AFI uh, double mention for Collins. This gotta episode. do it. Gotta <laughs> do it. <laughs> Not allowed. Perfect record, kind of like the apotheosis, the apotheosis of um, I think what what basement hardcore had been throughout the '90s and putting it all in a succinct, in a succinct package while simultaneously making it somewhat accessible for more mainstream audiences. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this was Victory's highest selling record uh, to date, at least prior to Tell All Your Friends. I think when Thursday got signed to Def Jam, Def Jam had to pay uh, something like $2 million just to get them out of the Victory deal, which says a lot about how much they exploded during this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 42, Owls, Everyone is My Friend. This is surprisingly high, but this, yes. this song yes. is yes. incredible. The, the, whole, the whole album is just... This is, this album, this is a perf another perfect album. And so, yeah, I'm, I, I can't... I, even I can't be upset at Ian Cohen about this choice. <laughs> yeah. 
I love Ian so much, but he's giving me so much to clown on here. Um, but no, can't clown on cl- can't clown on this pick at all. Great fucking record. Victor, I think, is one of the all time emo guitarists. Like probably my my pick for the best emo guitarist of all time. Has anyone heard his project No Yes? I don't uh, think they so. Put out, they put out an EP like a very long time ago. You can find it on Spotify, but it's phenomenal. Um, yeah, No Yes. I, I think it's better than Ghosts and Vodka. And Ghosts and Vodka is good too. They Ghosts just, and Vodka is fantastic. They just oh announced God. that they're pressing that. Ghosts and Vodka? Yeah. Um, hopefully more people listen to it because I think that's the most perennially underrated Kinsella project. Maybe next to yeah. Sky Corvair. Um, 41, Texas is the reason, back into the left. Another one I cannot complain about or clown on whatsoever. I think Texas is the reason is massively important to emo. One of the big three of quote-unquote Midwest emo. Uh, I think it's funny that they get kind of thrown in there because they are essentially uh, a New York hardcore band that doesn't play New York hardcore. (laughs) Um, Garrett Klon, like Colin said earlier, um, not a conventionally good vocalist, but extremely powerful extremely unique charisma and magic bleeding through in these guitar riffs yeah definitely riffs like massive riffs and the songwriting was more concise than a a lot of the other like post-hardcore revelation groups of the time like you know like far side gets a far side gets a little weird into another like it's a little weird but texas is more more focused i was gonna bring up I was going to bring up into another like EP creepy or creepy EP. Sorry. That, that record gets like pretty, pretty fucking out there. But Texas is the reason is extremely concise and the riffs, uh, they definitely feel descended from like burn or 108, but rather than being like propulsive or rock hard, they kind of just wash over you like water. Mm -hmm. Um, do the kids listen to Texas is the reason a little bit little bit i i think back in like the late 2000s early 2010s it was more of a thing like i remember seeing usernames like johnny on the spot 09 or whatever yeah. um i i think that maybe texas is the reason is a little bit more uh underrated among the below 20 set now yeah because yeah, i mean but like the below 20 set is fucking with braid but for some reason they don't make it to texas is the reason which is weird because before Braid put out No Coast, I would say it was kind of reversed. Yeah. Number 40, Jimmy Eat World, Lucky Denver Mint. There's Number more Jimmy Eat World songs. Yeah, there's more Jimmy Eat World songs here, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. there are? Okay, cool. I was going to say that wouldn't have been my... But this this does make sense as a pick because it was closest thing they had to a hit prior to the middle. As Emma writes here, it was on the soundtrack for Never Been Kissed. Never Been Kissed is a fucking great soundtrack. Uh, Nowhere Slow by Homegrown is on that soundtrack. Um, and that's like in my top three pop punk songs ever made. So I, I think Ian Cohen's gone on record to say that Clarity is his favorite album, like period, of all time. And I know Jimmy Eat World is Tom Mullen's favorite band. And Jimmy Eat World is one of the few bands from this era that even like gnarly cynical old hardcore dudes are like oh yeah i i support jimmy world all the way they're cool great guys i just think the the songwriting especially on this song is just so glistening and beautiful and perfect even though it might not be my personal pick i get it you know i think it's a great song yeah they're they're the reason i i actually like discovered that i liked emo i didn't know what it was it was it was it was like years and years ago but i heard um i forgot what song it was was it 23 or something like that and i was like what is this like, this is so cool and you know do some browsing on the internet and oh that's emo and it just kind of did it for me i think it's weird they i i think it's weird they called it an experimental album i don't i wouldn't say it's experimental i, I guess the last track's a little bit experimental but it's a pretty straightforward album in my opinion but yeah well, it's a great album. It's a great album. It, it's, and uh, that was a song's a good choice too. Would you have put Goodbye Sky Harbor in the spot? But... No, I, I, Goodbye Sky Harbor I would say is the only thing that's actually a little experimental. You would so you wouldn't put it on this list because oh, I no, no. The song. I yeah I think it's the best song on that album personally. Oh, it's a great. It, it's absolute. It's great. It, it just it's just not. Uh, I don't think it would go on the list because it's 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 uh, reaching a little too far. 
Yeah, not, not doesn't quite fall into the emo bucket. Yeah. Or, all right, I got you. They did a rendition of the middle with Taylor Swift. What the fuck? When did that happen? I didn't know. Uh, it was a live thing. Oh no. my god. <laughs> I gotta look that up when this is done. Okay. Uh, I wonder what Taylor Swift thinks about if that's on Spotify. I wonder who gets the royalties for that. How do they split? I know Taylor Swift is super concerned about royalties. <laughs> uh, these next two tracks. Um, could not be more opposite on the emo spectrum, but I am so fucking <laughs> <out of> <laughs> um, 39 Orchid, I am Nietzsche. <laughs> Holy fuck. The, the drop on this song gives me chills every time I listen to it, and I've been listening to this song for like 13, 15 years. Oh my fucking god. Perfect, perfect example of screamo songwriting. <laughs> Does, uh, please, can someone please have thoughts on Orchid except for me? Um, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm really scared about this. Of course, I, I, of course I have thoughts on Orchid. <laughs> <laughs> the, the amount of influence that Orchid had on Emo and Screamo at the time is like, is, it, was, it was almost catastrophic. It, there were just so many bands that wanted to sound like Orchid after, after uh, Chaos Is Me came out and Mm -hmm. um, and some bands like were very good at it, and some bands were not good at it. But it definitely like they were. I think Orchid had the amount of influence that sonically and you know aesthetically that uh, people that like uh, music writers want to give. Uh, I hate myself, and oh for sure, even, and even yeah. Seisha, like I think I think Orchid was even more like more influential as, as far as like actual pushing things forward was even more influential than Seisha at the time, for sure. It's not that there were that there weren't other bands that did what Orchid did before them, because Inhumanity was around, Palatka was around, End of the Century yeah. Party, all these bands that kind of fused just the open aggression of power violence and grindcore with uh, the, the melodic reach of emo and screamo. But Orchid just had the personality and charisma like just absolutely dripping with it um, yeah they had they had the ideas they had the like the the artwork was always just like ahead and the songwriting was always one step ahead the recording like it was just they were they were uh, just out there i am too young unfortunately to have seen them live but i've seen a couple videos and also they're just fucking explosive it was it was a it was a crazy experience to see them live like I yeah I, I I saw them two nights in a row, album came, before this uh, ten inch came out and and it was just like it was I was floored from the the moment they've started playing. Um and on a technical level I think the production on this record is a little worse than Chaos Is Me, but I think that actually helps it. It just sounds like when it gets violent it sounds like you are inside of a blender, like just really chaotic and kinetic like oh yeah no i i, I love a blow i love a blown out sounding recording <laughs> yeah i think that's that's a thing that screamo kind of missed like as it went on it just doesn't have that uh hardcore derived like thump in your chest physical quality yeah that's why life lifeless by loma prieta is one of my favorites uh, oh yeah Donna, yeah because that just because the recording like it's you know got that excellent song my favorite orchid song personally um i really like the description not of ugly quite beautiful high yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> if if we want to pivot into like a like a philosophical discussion i know that nietzsche ended up kind of being subsumed on the internet um as being part of like right-wing ideology and there's lots of arguments you can make for that but Orchid, like, were one of those bands that openly discussed, like, the Frankfurt School, and you can kind of trace a lot of, like, the complaints about cultural Marxism right back to the Frankfurt School. Nietzsche was super important to, like, post-structuralism, and I do think Screamo is, in a sense, like, a, a postmodern, post-structuralist kind of genre. So, even on, like, a conceptual level, the song works great. 38, Saves the Day at Your Funeral. This is the one. It's a safe, it's the one. safe, safe song. I want to hear thoughts about Saves the Day. 
Come on, I know you'll have it. Through being cool is... It's not my favorite because I know Ellie hates me for liking... Uh, uh, what's the DreamWorks record called? Uh, In Reverie. In Reverie, yeah. I love that one a lot. That, that's one that I want to listen to these days. But uh, Through Being Cool... I do hate you for that. Would be... <laughs> Uh, would be just as safe as at your funeral. I stopped listening. I I stopped listening after through being cool, so I I can't really speak to say what you are. The older That's I get, the more I think can't slow down might be my favorite saves the day record. I do have such like a soft spot in my heart for at your funeral, and really this this entire record. I think Brad Nelson, who did the write up here, mm-hmm. is a a little wrong when he kind of traces the lines of taking back Sunday and Fall Out Boy back to this record, I think you could trace them more strongly back to Through Being Cool. And Stay What You Are is more of, like, the beginning of, like, those Beatles uh, and broader psych rock influences that In in Reverie kind of started playing with. Um, This is, I think, still their most played song on Spotify. It was really fucking huge at the time. And it still gives me chills whenever I sing along to it. Um, yeah, yeah. There's like a Leno or Letterman performance of the song that is like really amazing to watch because like they they seem so shocked that they're doing what they're doing and like yeah, uh, and they're <laughs> so fucking tight still. I love uh, Chris Conley's voice too. Mm-hmm. Like it's so like it's it's so good. On... Kind of close to your voice, yeah. dude. I literally get that. Every single time somebody listens to our band, I could show you, I could scroll through Instagram messages <laughs> like, hey, I just listened to Closure for the first time. You sound just like Chris Conley. It's so sick. Like, it's it's super funny. I didn't want to say that out of like, and be like, hey, by the way, people compare me to this great singer named Chris Conley. But it happens all the time. High register. <laughs> yeah. Chris Conley kind of grew out of this as time went on, even though like other elements of the songwriting kind of went to shit. Uh, but do you think that Saves the Day was kind of the genesis of kind of grossly uh, violent, verging into misogynistic territory and emo lyrics? Yes. No, but- I don't I don't I don't think so. I, I, I think that the bands that were influenced by them went that direction. Like but I, I don't I don't think Saves the Day like there was more, more definitely more like self sadness in the saves the day lyrics. More about like, like oh woe is me than there was you know, I can't believe a woman would do this. Like brand new lyrics and shit. Sure, uh, but I I I do think you're right that the bands that saves the day influence took it further. But mm-hmm. I can't like shake a little bit of discomfort when I listen to like Rockstonic Juice Magic. You know, let me take this awkward saw and run it against your thighs. Yeah, like, see, like, he, like, wrote them in very kind of clouded ways and not just, like, fuck her, she dumped me or she's yeah. a stupid bitch type stuff. Yes, yes. Um, there's, like, there is, like, a little bit of an uncomfortable undertone, um, but I do think that Chris Conley's songwriting is, like, idiosyncratic and unique enough that um, he, gets a, he gets a little bit of a pass, especially since there doesn't seem to be open hatred so much as just like as much as it conveys like just his personal pain i don't know now i'm now i'm getting severely off topic (laughs) uh 37 joyce manor constant headache it's a huge song uh i probably listen to this song every day in 2011 wow i mean i i've listened to this album like that entire summer that it came out and stuff Whenever you see this band live, when the song comes on, it, like the entire room is just pushing and yelling. Uh, it's yeah. completely get it. It's like a gigantic anthem. It's a gigantic sing along. Yeah. And Shinobu got a got a shout yeah. out yeah. in the, the write up. Yeah. That that was that was pretty great. I remember reading an interview with uh, with Barry Johnson where he shouted out like a ton of just like fairly obscure DIY California bands. Uh, uh, that actually was the first time that I heard of Shinobu. I still don't think that Joyce Manor is emo. I just, I just don't. They, they've always been uh, some flavor of pop punk or power pop to me. I mean, that makes sense. But uh, I mean, in the with this list, like, there's definitely a lot of pop punk that was influenced by emo that gets put on this list. So I think they. I think they fit just fine. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them emo either, but 
that as far as for the purpose of this list, it it makes sense at least. Yeah. So you're our California correspondent, and uh, Joyce Manor are abnormally gigantic in California. Like they played that show with Jeff Rosenstock and AJJ that was like at like a five thousand capacity venue and yes. it sold out. Yeah. Yeah, they're 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 huge. Everyone they're they're like the local 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 heroes in the the torrents. But like you watch videos of them playing like all of the the like classic California DIY spots like Gilman, uh and then there's the one that the Lauren Records crew ran. I forgot what it's called. V L H S or something. Yeah, like yeah, V L H S in, in Pomona. So, but like this is one of those bands that went from like DIY to Tumblr, and the rest is history. The songs are very, the songs are very memorable. Yeah, they're they've got mm -hmm. hooks. Like it's, it, it makes sense, and, and the you can just like pick up pick pick up on the the pick up on the melodies and everything real quick. It's they're they know how to write a song. Yep. Yep. I found I found the interview, um, and Barry also shouted out uh, Le Joshua in that interview, who are a very, very good band. 36, Braid, A Dozen Roses. I think this should have been one or two. <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously. Like, this should be number one or number two on this entire list. Like, I don't... Uh, the fact that it's in the 30s is the main issue I take with it. But it, but it definitely is a song, and... All of the only thing that I mean, maybe maybe new Nathan in Detroit, but like that. Uh, new Nathan Detroit, sure. Uh, I also think uh, Forever Got Shorter is probably my personal favorite. That, yeah, that's a great choice too. I, but I, I think that yeah, I think that like top top three. <laughs> it's it it really is just completely distills like the Midwest emo sound in a way that like perfected it i think we should pass a law to make it illegal to talk shit about braid i think mm -hmm. my favorite thing about braid is just kind of the way that braid itself was a logical progression from friction bob nana's other older bands yeah uh, but also how braid logically progressed themselves throughout the 90s oh, um, the, the last the last seven inch was some of their best stuff like and yeah before i mean before they got back together but mm -hmm. the, the please drive faster seven inches some of their best stuff and like that was you know just it was all every single step they took was a progression and got better and better and then yeah it was and even the even the, the new albums or the new that that ep they put out after they got back together i wasn't sold on it when i first got it but then i saw them play some of the songs live and i was then i was hooked and it like it just it made it made more sense and like everything yeah came together um i don't know they just they're so important for that period of time in that scene and uh should have gotten should have gotten a little higher there braid i've always said are a band that were forever and will forever be ahead of their time i think it's always been hard for people to catch up to what braid did i can't think of another band that knew what they wanted to do and kept pushing it further in the emo scene as much as braid did <laughs> A lot of songs on this album sound like they could fall apart at any point, but they never do. And it, it, like, yeah. it just amazes me every time I listen to it. And also the best drummer, like, yeah, hands yeah. Down, the best, the best drummer of that entire era. The fact that none of their songs necessarily have hooks per se, but they are all catchy and memorable in their own way. I think, I think speaks to the complexity and propulsion of their songwriting. Yeah. Um, 35. How do you feel about how do you feel about this being one spot ahead of Bray? <laughs> so. I, I think I think it's I think it's pretty rude, but they, you know, we all we all make our choices and we have to live with them. But uh, <laughs> I I just I mean, uh, Fall Out Boy was a pop punk band. They uh, they they always they were the only like the only thing that was emo, I guess, was. Pete Wentz's sad sack lyrics. Andy Hurley uh, has cred. Oh yeah, uh, uh, they yeah. all have massive. They, they, yeah, they 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 all came. Uh, they all they were all they were all around. They all did really good stuff before Fallout Boy. And I don't I I don't begrudge anyone popularity or like 
getting big. I, I don't I don't believe in the concept of selling out mm-hmm. for the most part, but I, I I just I don't think Fallout Boy's emo either. Uh, in case in case the listeners haven't gathered, this is Fallout Boy Sugar. We're going down. I don't even think that if you're doing a close listen to Fallout Boy, emo is the genre that you'd trace it back to. You would probably trace it back to hardcore, or sorry, like specifically more like the '90s metalcore type stuff, because they they even call themselves uh, Chicago softcore for like their first couple years of existence. Really, I think what what defined their style was that kind of chuggy guitars, uh, melodic leads lying over it, and then Patrick Stump, who, if in all fairness, has an amazing voice. And the fact that he's able to like take Pete Wentz's lyrics and make something resembling an extremely catchy melody out of it is an achievement into itself unto itself yeah i like that um i I like uh unconventional songwriting like that but i just still stand by it they shouldn't be on the list this is the 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 next one too this is great (laughs) (laughs) like the most the most like emo thing about Fall Out Boy is their ridiculously long song titles let's be real yeah Mm. (laughs) Well, I'd actually make an argument that you could take like the the verses, like the guitar work in the verses of the song, and trace it back to emo a little bit. There, there is like a little bit of like the Midwest emo gentle caressing thing going on. Um, but even that is like not a thing they did really anywhere else on this album or anywhere else in their discography. I think that this is my favorite like Fall Out Boy record. It's the one I listen to the most for sure. I never like at one point thought that I was like listening to an emo band. It's definitely like super reminiscent of pop punk. It's I mean it is like early pop punk, you know. I never really thought of it as anything different. I'm surprised to see it on the list, honestly. Well, no, I'm not. But no, like, you're not what I mean? at all. I am surprised. It's uh, Fall Out Boy's first appearance is higher than My Chem's first appearance, though. Fall Out Boy are still around and more popular than ever somehow. Andy's new band, Sect, is one of my favorite new hardcore bands. Oh, that band fucks good. That's got to see. That's got to see your cues guy in it, Collins. It's got Scott from uh, Earth Crisis. Really? Is in Sect. Yeah, mm-hmm. great band. Like that actually doesn't surprise me at all. There's surprisingly a lot of really famous Syracuse musicians, like the Red Jumpsuit Apparatus guitar player, Earth Crisis. Uh, oh yeah, the drummer from State Champs. You know, there's a lot of people. Kind of yeah. interesting. I uh, th- this is I think songwriting wise the best follow up <clears throat> my album. Yeah, definitely. Um, not my favorite though. My favorite is still Take This to Your Grave. <laughs> Thirty four Death Cab for Cutie, a movie script ending. Can we just skip this one? Like <laughs> I don't really have much to say about like Death Cab. It. They're they're good, but just strike I've it. Never heard them. this song. They're the other the Death Cab for Cutie are great. I love them, but they, like they they belong on this list as much as Weezer, like, which is not <laughs> I could make an argument for putting the song title track on this list if I really, really wanted to, but I don't particularly, so let's move on. <laughs> 33, Mineral, Gloria. Hell yeah. So, the, the first sentence of this write-up, more than any form of punk rock, emo is interconnected with theology. That's interesting. That's, um, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a flat-out lie. <laughs> Uh, I, that, is a, I, that is an irresponsible sentence. This is Krishna Core erasure. Yeah, exactly. I'm, <laughs> I not, I'm not. I'm not standing for that. It is really interesting that a lot of emo bands were outright or very subtly Christian. Even like further seems forever have like hints of that. And yeah, but, but they came from Christian hardcore. I, I yeah. would say that I would say that I would say that Christian hardcore is is way more inter like or hardcore is way more interconnected with theology because Christian hardcore is way huger and way more of a thing than Christian emo. So that's a that's, a, that's it. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. I want to take it a step further, metalcore? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, I'm, for sure. It, it, like I mean, all the guys on Further Seems Forever were mostly in strong arm. Which yeah. was a Christian hardcore band, and then like, you know that. So that's where that all came from. Side note: 
strong arm are fucking phenomenal. Um, oh, yeah. They're just amazing. <laughs> Christian Shy Halud, in a sense. So the song. <laughs> this, is a, this is a great fucking song. This is, I think, uh, my favorite mineral song. And it probably is also the mineral song. Uh, lots of lots of people compare mineral, especially their early stuff, to Sunny Day Real Estate. And I can hear it, but I don't think it's to the point where you could even consider mineral anywhere close to being a Sunny Day Real Estate ripoff. Does that maybe, timeline even work? It it, it does, because this record came out in 97. Diary came out in 94. Yeah, but, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a Sunny Day Real Estate influence for sure. Yeah, and I, I can hear it, but the production, which, by the way, the production on this record feels like chewing tinfoil. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think helps distance uh, Mineral from Sunny Day. And also, the vocals are just really, really far away from anything Jeremy and Ike was even trying to do. Yeah. yeah. Probably uh, one of the most concise and energetic Midwest emo songs which at this time I think well, that that genre was known a lot for like these kind of loping plotting songs that built up for four or five minutes and then paid off. And Mineral especially were in that in that realm. But this song's just like a front to back banger. Yeah, I I would have chosen Parking Lot off this record, but the, that's besides the besides the writing about it. I think Gloria is a great choice. My favorite song is And Serenading. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, in yeah, Serenade, that record, that record, amazing. Mm-hmm. And and Serenading is is a a huge track. I yeah. love that album. I love that album. That and that song especially. I I think and Serenading more than uh, American football even is the reason that a lot of modern emo sounds the way it does. Personally, thirty two dag nasty circles. This has been a debate I've had before kind of the the assertion that Dag Nasty was part of the Revolution Summer scene. To From what I've managed to glean from the many oral histories of this era, they kind of were, but kind of weren't simultaneously. Because um, they... I, I feel like Dag Nasty was much closer to like driving melodic rock than kind of like the introspective expressive outgrowth of hardcore that defined a lot of the revolution summer stuff and i think you could make more of an argument for dag nasty being an influence on like gorilla biscuits and all all sorts of melodic hardcore after that much more than you could for dag nasty being like a seminal emo band that being said I am not going to put up a fight with this being on this list, especially since it's such a perfect fucking song. Yeah, I, I, I think it's if you're going to choose a Dag Nasty song, this is the one. And uh, it, it, I think it's is OK on the list. And I'm surprised it's as high as it is just because it's not as big as some of the songs that came before it. But I'm not going to I'm not going to argue with Nina at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a god tier Oh, God here. Mm-hmm. What do you think about the line that says "come across er, circles come across" like it could have been written by a young, brand new, or cloud nothings? I don't. The brand new part, I, I just don't. I I didn't find anything good or interesting about brand new when I listened to them. <laughs> so I, I I can't I can't back that up at all. But cloud nothings, sure, yeah. There's they definitely I could I could see that. I think I always think of cloud nothings more as a Husker do. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. Sound. Yeah. Uh, but Dag Nasty. Yeah. That that makes sense. I'm surprised there there's they're kind of delving into like the emo genesis bands here. I'm surprised there's not more love for like Husker Du or Articles of Faith or Squirrel Bait on this yeah. list. That I, seems I, like you know that, like any of those bands could have taken the place of Dag Nasty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Probably. I. I can maybe kind of hear the cloud nothings thing when it comes to brand new i think circles sounds more like something like the rookie lot would write more than Mm. uh anything from brand new themselves right but i can kind of maybe vaguely see where this is coming from uh 31 alkaline trio bleeder i had not heard this song before it's not the song i would have chosen from alkaline trio but i I didn't Um, really consider alkaline trio emo i guess either i never really thought about it alkaline trio are the the seminal gruff sad pop punk band like 
proto Lawrence Arms. Yes, yeah, specifically in the, in the Chicago pop punk. punk. Yes, yeah, um, and like Red City Radio. Pretty much everything that came to be labeled as Orcore. Is this the song you would have chosen if you had to put them on the list or no? No, no. If I was, if I, if I, <laughs> gun to my head, had to put an Alkaline Trio song on an emo list, I probably would have picked Clavicle. What yeah, about man. something like Radio though? Radio is just a classic though. Yeah. Clavicle would be Clavicle or um, San Francisco would be a, would have been right, my choice. Yeah, yeah, San Francisco. San Francisco. Sure. Uh, maybe even like Sorry About That. Yeah, pretty much anything from God damn it. The more that we're talking about it, I feel like if we just rush the internet, just being like Alkaline Trio is an emo band, people would buy it and they would be written into emo history. <laughs> I mean, th that's what this list is doing. So. <laughs> sure. <Yeah. why> <laughs> <laughs> but like David Anthony is like top five, like biggest Alkaline Trio fans, right? Yes. Yes. There, there was no doubt in my mind when I got to this one that the byline would be David Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I, I, I saw them, I saw them on this tour, and they'd even made a shirt that had stars on it as a joke. Um, that people called them emo then. Like they, they had a T-shirt that like had like some stars on it, and they were like, "Yeah, we made an emo shirt." As a joke. Oh, because and, of, like the, the star tattoos. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> Stars and sparrows. So they they'd even they'd even made like a you know they they were like already goofing on that even in I think it was ninety ninety eight or whatever because I'm I'm seventy two years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I wish I was more into Alkaline Trio because then I think I probably would have a lot more to say on this, but. As it stands, I'm pretty much a goddamn head. But yeah, so then I I I can't really argue much in the way for or against the song being on the list, except for I would have picked a goddamn it track. Yeah, this is a deep cut. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thirty, cursive the recluse. So this is from my favorite cursive album, but uh, Domestica is their most emo album. That's my only yep. that that that's my only beef with this track. But yeah, this is probably Cursive's biggest song. And yes, it's an amazing song. It's weird because my favorite Cursive song probably wouldn't belong on on this list. Um, What's your favorite Cursive song? Oh, the Radiator Hums. Oh yeah, perfect. Yeah, that would have been that would have been a great choice. Yep, I think. I, <laughs> that I, have, I have a lot of I have a lot of thoughts on Cursive, but I'm not. We don't need to. Hey, the, yeah. <laughs> Cur Cursive is my favorite band, so we can talk about it. For this list's purpose, a song off of uh, Domestica would have been the best choice. Um, if it were up to me, I, I would have probably put Break in the New Year or uh, the uh, one of the songs off the, the Silver Scooter split. Um, mm, yeah. But, uh, uh, Tides Rush In would be my other, my, my other choice, so... I don't know. <laughs> uh, I would go with deep cuts for cursive. Yeah, there's some really just like when I think of emo, I think of some cursive songs because they're so fucking bleak and uh, their guitars sound like fucking band saws <laughs> on some of their songs. Yeah. But like for the sake of like a commercial emo list, I think The Recluse is fine. Uh, so I think sonically... Y'all are probably right. The Domestica is probably their most emo record. But I remember listening to The Ugly Organ um, in preparation to see Cursive Live and texting Kyle. Wow, this record really is just like Tim Casher slitting his wrists in your ears <laughs> for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, um, this band, I think, does such a good job of not being able to be put in a box that... It, it's almost weird to me that this many years later they're considered to be primarily emo. That's like generally the consensus I hear. But they are like quintessentially post hardcore, right? Like in the sense of taking a hardcore bass and just stretching it far past the confines of what hardcore could be considered. Yeah. Uh, that's the weird thing about Cursive is like they're, they're in the sight line of so many genres. Like the the ugly organ got a lot of like like Rolling Stone love when it came out and yeah. like Pitchfork love yeah. and then post hardcore people were fucking with it. Like, there was a tour that was fucking against me Mastodon in cursive. 
Holy shit. I don't remember the lyric, but I remember posting a lyric uh, on my like first Facebook many years ago from a cursed song from this album, and my mom was like, delete that. <laughs> was it my ego's like my stomach? I keep shitting what I feed yes. it. <laughs> yes, yes, that was it. Holy fuck. <laughs> uh, I also once posted the lyrics of the best ever death metal band out of Denton by Mountain Goats, and my mom was like, delete that too. Was it Hail Satan? <laughs> Yeah, Hail Satan. <laughs> she was like, "You're friends with your teachers," and I was like, "I should change that." So I made a new Facebook account. <laughs> um, Twenty nine, Motion City soundtrack. Let's get fucked up and die. This uh, this write up starts out fucking great. According to developmental psychologists, while most people begin to detect sarcasm through tone around age 8, it takes until age 11 to understand sarcasm in its best form. <laughs> Deadpan, blunt, and unflinchingly solemn jabs at your own expense. I think Motion City Soundtrack uh, are a phenomenal fucking band. I think that is part of why they aren't considered to be the same level as like other bands of their era, like New Found Glory. Um, or Fall Out Boy, uh, it's it's because even even more than Fall Out Boy, who I think kind of are the are the definition of like sarcastic lyrics. Uh, Motion City soundtrack are they are sarcastic, but they also come from an even more exceedingly dark place, uh, owing to Justin Pierre like literally being a meth addict before the before the band started. Uh, and just writing so bluntly about alcoholism and addiction and self-destruction. I, I really wish that they kind of had crossed over into that point where people could look past those lyrics and become the biggest band in the world because they fucking deserve that. Their songwriting is so good. I never really had like a phase with this band but this was certainly like the song that was getting passed around the most at like my middle school at the time or high school at the time i don't know just because it was so fucking like blunt and hard on its sleeve yeah this record as a whole has some of like the the most bleak lyrics that i think justin pierre ever wrote like if you listen to the song better open the door uh yeah yeah i've listened to this full album okay um yeah the that song is like fucking bleak and sad uh mm -hmm. but it's also simultaneously like fucking catchy as hell like the lyrical dissonance that motion city soundtrack is capable of is on a completely other level i also think justin pierre is underrated as like a vocalist uh he he has like a really pleasant timbre and really good range i think yeah he can he can move through those notes you know honestly he's he he like writes like some kind of emo or punk guy that would write a really good book or novel. yes yes i would love to see a justin pierre book uh especially because uh keith buckley's books are really fucking oh, yeah, good yeah exactly and and i I think Justin Pierre lyrically shares a lot with with uh, Keith Buckley. Um, also, I think it's interesting to see Motion City soundtrack here because I know a lot of people would consider them just straight up pop punk or power pop. But if you go back to like their really early stuff, they actually are like very derivative of Midwest emo and post hardcore. Mm -hmm. um, it took them a while to get to like this extremely polished point. I think it also took them a while for Justin Pierre to really get a grasp on this, this type of lyricism. Tables. Collins, you've been quiet. Yes, I have. <laughs> I, I never really listened. To, I would never really listen to Motion City soundtrack. I'll be honest. It's just, just like holy fuck. Change that yeah. immediately. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna have to I, after listening to that exchange. I'll probably go back. Um, it was one of those bands that like all my like my friends that i'd listen to like mcr with and stuff like love motion city soundtrack but i just for some reason never really check it out so you never even heard uh heard uh everything is all right uh probably not i'll be honest like i when i listen to music it's like in binge form so like if i'm listening to something it's just like i only listen to that for like a month or two and then i go on so if i haven't binged them i probably haven't really listened to much of them no i feel like everything is all right has been on a ton of like movie soundtracks and then i could have heard it i mean yeah. honestly it's possible 
yeah that that was a fucking huge song and when i saw them with the with the wonder years they played everything is all right like third in the set and i was like <laughs> okay this is gonna be this is gonna be a real good motion city soundtrack set <laughs> i only saw them on their final tour and of course two years later they're touring again i i think the breakup was like mandated for like label reasons and as soon as like as soon as justin did his solo record I think they were clear to come back. That's what yeah, I heard. Yeah, yeah. I've heard I've heard that song. I just listened to it on Spotify. That is <laughs> super 2005. That sounds like now I so I used to listen to like the weird like ob, like the obscure like shitty pop punk because it reminded me of like middle school and now I understand where all those bands got their songs from. Oh yeah. Big like time. it's super reminiscent of like all those like local like local pop punk bands that I used to see like touring through Syracuse. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'll give you a cookie if, without Googling, you can guess who produced this album. I couldn't even fucking begin to imagine. It's not Jay Robbins, <laughs> is it? No. No way off, in fact. Kurt Ballou. <laughs> no, Mark Compass. Oh. I didn't uh... know. <laughs> that's that's yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, did I even know Patrick... he was a producer? He doesn't do much production work, but okay. he tried his hand with this record, and I think it worked real real well. It also, Patrick really sparkly. Stump, yeah, Patrick Stump does uh, some backing vocals at the end of Everything Is All Right. That's cool. Which, That's a cool mashup. Which is cool because Justin Pierre uh, does the guest vocals in the bridge of Chicago's So Two Years Ago by Fall Out Boy. <laughs> so six degrees of separation with all these Midwest pop punk bands. Seth, are you back? Uh, you got any thoughts on Motion City soundtrack? Uh, the pop punk band, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they're they're a good pop punk band, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have put them on this list. Uh, the excuse that a lot of pop punk bands get when they get put on these lists is, oh, their lyrics are sad, which I think normally is bullshit. But yeah. <laughs> uh, the the lyrics of Motion City soundtrack are so overwhelmingly sad that I can kind of see it. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I have I've never heard their older stuff, so I gotta check that out. If you're if you're saying it, it's a little. More oh yeah, yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, they have like 97 demos that are like straight up emo. Um, speaking of straight up emo, Don Martin Three Transistor. This is this is like a name that was given to the song way after the fact, right? Like yeah. I don't think Don Martin Three named their songs kind of similarly yeah. to Summer. This is a perfect fucking song. Nina did it again. Yeah, Nina did I, it again. Yeah. I'm, I I wanted to talk about this list for two reasons. One of them, Weezer's not an emo band, and two, there's a Don Martin three song on this list. Those are the two main reasons <laughs> that I wanted to talk about this list. I can't believe that a, a Don Martin three song made a top anything list in 2020. So. This is a this is some some real deep stuff that is essential to the you know the sound for sure. Yeah, this is like this isn't emo with any type of qualifier. This isn't like oh this is Revolution Summer emo. This isn't oh this is Midwest emo. This isn't oh this is emo pop. This is emo like capital E. One of the one of the first fucking songs I think of. Um, and this whole record, because this is a, this comes off a split with Moonraker and Hope Springs Eternal, um, and I think that's probably in my Desert Island top five, uh, quote unquote, real emo uh, splits up there with uh, Lincoln and Hoover, like absolutely fucking perfect. <laughs> This is music that sounds like it's barely holding itself together. I feel like that's a phrase that's been that's been repeated quite a couple times mm -hmm. in this in this list. That's part of what makes emo emo because hardcore is emotional. Like as as we've talked about and as Ian MacKay so famously proclaimed, I think what what makes emotive hardcore its own thing is it being so intense that it it sounds like you can't even keep yourself together. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Also, Don Martin Three, another Florida band. Something's in the fucking water in Florida. That, I think Florida that, like... Seriously, that era of like Florida, what, the music coming out of Florida is is one of the the best scenes for that music 
music. Same, it's like similar to San Diego in that um, the early '90s, like mid '90s era. It, it's just like so many amazing bands who came out of Florida at the time. It, it was yeah, it was crazy. And the thing that's interesting about Florida is it's so fucking huge that the scenes in Florida themselves were very insular, like throughout the state. Yeah, um, the Gainesville scene and the Pensacola scene were not the same, you know? Mm. Um, and, and I think it's incredible that this many years down the line, uh, we could still go back and look at Florida bands and be like, oh shit, this is where all this came from. Is Hot Water Music on this list? Have we come across a Hot Water Music song yet? No. <laughs> they, have, they haven't been on it yet. I don't think they are. Uh, 27, everyone everywhere, I feel exhausted. It's and we're back way to... too fucking high. I'm like, I'm like honestly shocked that this is this high on here, even on here at all. Like, I love this band, but I was like, I saw this and I was like, oh shit. Back when I was uh, getting into Emo Revival, everyone everywhere was like, first on the lips, you know? And especially, I think, because of this record. This record blew the fuck up. Not in a, not in like a broad blog sense, but like within the scene i'm not surprised to see it on this list but i am absolutely surprised to see it at 27 i was expecting <laughs> yeah. to see it like in the 80s uh, we kept going back and forth about this band when we were doing the decade stuff and it was kind of like yeah this band isn't like one of our favorites but like i think this was like one of the, the bands that kind of got attention and people were like oh there are bands that still sound like this yes big time that that was kind of the win in its sales to like get it to number twenty seven, I guess. Can I have a have a hot take? I would switch this song's place with the Cath of It song. I would I would trade those two. Yeah. Also, Maybe. the the end of this write up, the Deftones inspired bridge. If I had a fucking quarter for every time in the past three years that I've seen the phrase Deftones inspired uh in in a music write-up i would be able to pay off the rest of my student loans <laughs> all right 26 drive like jehu do you compute hell yeah hell yeah hell yeah oh thanks david anthony for uh shouting out sascore <laughs> <laughs> drive like jehu are, are they're more rocking than a lot of the bands of the time but they were they were right there with everybody and the i just really really important to especially california scene at the time yeah yep. i think uh as like jittery and elliptical as drive like jay who were um they always struck me as very like sinewy and muscular this band had like a power to them that is why they're still so uh, popular and well-respected so many years down the line. And I think that also has to do a lot with uh, the members uh, going on to, you know... Producing Blink-182. Well, producing Blink-182, sure. <laughs> uh, Mark Trumpino, shout out. Uh, but also uh, Rocket from the Crypt. The, I feel like people forget that they were actually like fucking huge for a hot second. And there's another big band that I'm thinking of. And hot snakes. Googling them right in hot snakes yes yes yeah. that's uh yeah that's these two guys that are mentioned here rick froberg and john rice mm -hmm. I, there was another like sassy band that uh they were in that i think it's not well known now and unfortunately i'm forgetting the name of them but also i appreciate the shout out to pitchfork in this in this write-up uh because pitchfork were a great fucking band and uh, laid the groundwork for Drive Like Jehu in a big way. Yeah, they, um, they, they did. They were they were in that that whole that early '90s uh, the early '90s San Diego scene, which has like created so many so many great bands. Uh, is this is this the song? Um, I mean, Bullet Train to Vegas maybe would be. Yeah, I, yeah, is would be my choice. But I mean, that was that was also on the Don't Forget to Breathe comp. So that mm, yeah. sort of puts it puts it makes it a, even even a little more emo to me <laughs> mine mine would be here come the rome plows personally um is there any like discussion in drive like jehu versus yank crime or like the self-titled versus yank crime or is everyone kind of team yank crime i'm team yank crime personally 
I feel like I, I feel like most people are Team Yankrin. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Oh shit! Oh shit! Twenty-five. Pedro the Lion options. This this is a brutal song, not in a death metal way, but in a fuck. I feel genuinely worse about myself after listening to this song. Yeah, <laughs> but in a great way. Yeah. <laughs> I think Pedro the Lion's always been a little bigger than emo too. Like, they're indie. They're. Uh, I feel like I'm surprised by who finds out about Pedro the Lion because they they usually have like a Christian past and they kind of found them to uh, cut ties with their yeah. religious past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pedro the Lion is a big, in my experience, uh, with like music fans who are ex Christians. Page of the Lion is real big with them. Yeah. Like they're a big loss of faith band. Oh well, yeah, um, I mean, yeah, because David, because David Bazan is, is so outspoken about his own struggles with that yeah. and like his own his own path. Because I mean, yeah, because he he was on tooth and nail when he first started, and mm-hmm. then questioned his faith and has been very vocal about all that. It's it's a it makes sense. Even though, as you said, Kyle, Page of the Lion is kind of bigger than emo. Uh, I I think Control is top down an emo record. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. definitely indie rock influenced emo, but still recognizably emo. Yeah. Options is of course the song, but if I was making my own special list, I'd put second best here. Um, I think the climax of second best is like heavier than most hardcore breakdowns. <laughs> <laughs> Collins, Page of the Lion thoughts? I like Page of the Lion. I'm not like as like well versed as all of you are in the band, but um, it doesn't surprise me they're in the top 25. I think we're like reaching that point where now I'm seeing all these songs in the top 25, and I'm like, yeah, this this makes sense. And I think Pedro yeah. Lion fits in on that. In that number 24, City of Caterpillar, and you're wondering how a top floor could replace heaven. Re- Repeater Records of recording artists, City of. <laughs> 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 Is uh is City of Caterpillar? Are they like a an intro to this genre band, or are they like a, on the t- obscure side? Like I I I like them a lot, but I've kind of found them randomly, so I'm I'm not really sure if they're like a like no a they're favorite. They're first tier, yeah. They're definitely yeah. Like I, I I was in a second tier screamo band at the same time, and they were they were definitely more popular. The this I I mean the fact that this is as high as it is is great. I obviously like. City of Caterpillar, I put out their, I re- reissued their record, so I'm biased thinking that, yeah, that uh, should be in the top 25, especially th- this track was a great choice too. Um, it's uh, the way they, the way they built sound and like created feelings is with the music is more, uh, is uh, one of the most important things about that, about them. And the, you can like, just them, just like the way they layer things and the way, the chords work it just makes you you know you feel it it's it's a very cathartic listen yeah i yeah. like how they build like they're they're the way that they build throughout the songs is really like i don't know like you said cathartic is a good way for when the kind of songs kind of hit their climax but that just them building over the course of like seven minutes is always like fun to listen to i i think along with envy city of caterpillar are probably the band most responsible for bringing post-rock influence into screamo I think is very, very important for that genre's development. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, like like Seth was saying, they are first tier emo. I think when people are first getting into emo, they kind of get into that circle of page 99, City of Caterpillar, Majority Rule, all around the same time because of the interband connections. I think uh, Screamo itself, while not necessarily being like uh, an entry-level genre, in the context of Screamo, City of Caterpillar are pretty entry-level. <laughs> and not but, in that not in a bad way. Entry level <laughs> bands are normally entry level for a fucking reason. Yeah. Like, you you can't catch me talking shit about uh, Circle Takes a Square in your life, and they're entry level as fuck. I think I think that's all that needs to be said about City of Caterpillar. Perfect fucking band. Not not one flaw on this record. The unreleased songs that have popped up have also been like phenomenal. The, well, the re- the recording the recording of that the original recording of that record was a flaw and the the uh the remaster that we did 
sounds a lot better. <laughs> Just that's, Word. that's a two-mile yeah. horn, but it really, it really does. <laughs> All right. Uh, we ready to move on to 23? Yes. yes. I'm, I'm good, yeah. All right. 23, The Hotelier, Your Deep Rest. Fuck yes. This is the song. The, yep. This yeah. is the song. I don't know what we could say about the song that we didn't already say in our Home Like No Places There rundown. That's right. It's almost like a deconstructed pop punk song in some senses. Yes. Yes. And apologies to Christian for all the people who come to them saying oh i get it you're depressed so <laughs> um i at least uh made a case for myself not knowing that home like no place is theirs there's no place like home backwards because i ran a poll and a lot of people were like i didn't know that <laughs> okay and i'm sorry <laughs> um <laughs> because the song is so perfect i think it's uh prudent to move on to a song that maybe we have more to say about being on this list uh, especially this high, 22, Dashboard Confessional, hands down. Let's be real, though. It's the right Dashboard song. Like, if you had to. No, 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 no. I love this song. That's a great song. Not only is this not the Dashboard song, this isn't even, like, the version of Hands Down that I'd put if I had to put Hands Down. What would you, I'd put what the, would you put? If I had to do Hands Down, I'd put the So Impossible version that is acoustic. It's it's so obviously screaming infidelities. Or okay, I, I knew you were gonna say that. I fucking knew you were gonna say that. I don't know why, but I knew you were gonna say that. That's a good I mean, song that's, too. That's what that's what I would think too. And I don't even really know Dashboard Confession. I hardly know yes. anything about Dashboard, but I know this song. The thing is, Dashboard has several fucking songs that could be on this list. Like if you want to do like. Uh, like coming at it from like a more quote unquote true perspective, you'd put this bitter pill because Chris like literally just breaks down in sobs like in a genuine <laughs> sense at the end of that song. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or if you wanted to do like a totally mainstreamified version of this list, you'd put Vindicated, the Spider Man song. Spider Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, what Spider Man movie was that in? Spider Man two. Yeah. Okay. You've heard, you have to have heard that song, right, Colin? Of course, of course. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I, I'm like, I'm like a, I wouldn't say I'm like a huge Dashboard fan, but I like, I like really like Dashboard. Dashboard is a really fucking good band, like on a pop songwriting level, almost good enough to make up for the fact that Chris Caraba is like one of the worst lyricists who has ever walked this earth. <laughs> well, that's why that's that's my beef with Screaming Infidelities. I feel like he came up with one cool line, and was like, yes. And I just have to keep saying it over and over because it's so cool. Like <laughs> honestly, like yeah. it's kind of it's kind of, like your hair is everywhere, screaming infidelities and making its wear or whatever. Like I don't really, I guess I get it, but it's it's kind of silly. And the fact that it just repeats over and over for like three minutes is just kind of annoying. Yeah, there's worse lyrics in that song. Like I'm cuddling close to this bottle of beast, which masks. <laughs> Which masks, like, the one, like, real witty turn of phrase where he's like, I'm wondering how you're making out. And then he says, I wish I was anywhere with anyone making out. By dashboard standards, that's actually kind of witty, even though it's uh, cringy coming from literally any other person on Earth. But yeah, uh, Hands Down is a good song. No clue why this is the one picked. Um, sorry, Nina. Gen genuine apologies. You've done so good. <laughs> All right. Any other dashboard thoughts? All right. 21, Taking Back Sunday, A Decade Under the Influence. Oof. <laughs> I feel weird complaining about this song, given the fact that we have an entire series on our podcast named after it. This is not the Taking Back Sunday song. It's just not. Yes, that's true. It's true. I think, I think there should be zero, but <laughs> that's just my take on the situation. I personally would have gone with your so last summer here. Um, we have two My Chem songs from the same album. Which I also, disagree, I also disagree with, though. I think that you could have chosen another song besides Helena. Yeah, spoilers. Um, <laughs> and I know it's impossible that someone would have picked a Bullets song from my chem to be on this list, but bygones are bygones. 
I don't really like where you want to be. Um, in fact, I don't particularly like any Taking Back Sunday albums except for Tell All Your Friends. So, you don't like the smash hit Happiness Is? <laughs> Uh, have I ever told you about the time that I saw Taking Back Sunday with Every Time I Die? Was it the worst? They actually kind of ripped, except for the fact that most of their songs suck. Adam, but... is like, Adam is like a notoriously bad singer live, so I'm surprised that you thought that. Well, I have somehow now seen them twice, and he's actually been rather good both times. Um, but uh, when I saw them with Every Time I Die, there was just this literally like 50 to 60 year old man man who kept looking over at me and my buddy Josh whenever we sang along to a song from Tell Your Friends and just like patting us on the shoulder and being like, yeah, man, back in my day, which is his day was the, the fucking Yardbirds and the Zombies. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, as Collins can tell you, they're hit or miss. <laughs> they're like, no, like I remember that was like the first thing that I've like remember hearing about <clears throat> Taking Back Sunday when I got uh, into them when I first heard them was like yeah don't see them live if you like them on the record. Adam does no longer swings the mic though. That's not a thing he really does anymore. Was, yeah. was that was that did Adam like did he like kind of I don't want to say create because I'm sure somebody else did it before but was he the one that was really like the forefront of that like mic swinging uh, movement. Was- there were a bunch of Orange County bands that did that crap. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> and, and which is a which is a Fugazi thing. I feel like it just like the mic swing, like the pink tape on the microphone, swinging it and stuff, like was just so quintessentially like just a, just so quintessential. I feel like in that genre. And especially for like local bands that wanted to be Taking Back Sunday, I can name you like five Syracuse local bands that did the same shit. I was I played I actually played a show in in Syracuse many years ago, um, and uh, the one there was a the singer from one of the other bands was like in the like quote unquote backstage area practicing swinging his mic. It was one. What of year the, was this? It was two. This was two thousand. Five and it's Honor one, Bright, right? One of one of the lamest things I've ever seen in my life. I guarantee it was Honor Bright. I'd love it if you could find the if you could find the flyer because I would bet money that it was Honor Bright and that the person doing that was Liam DeCosimo because Liam <laughs> DeCosimo like did that like all the time. Like literally would practice backstage and shit. It was embarrassing, like for everybody. <laughs> no, no, they were like they like they played my friend's sixteenth birthday party. <laughs> so like <laughs> like if that puts it in perspective. What was that? What was that band's name again? I gotta look this up. Honor Bright. They had a song called Her- "Home Is a ha- Home Is a Heartache" that they played okay. on TRL. Okay. They played it with TRL. <laughs> they played TRL with with three oh three and Never Shout Never. Oh God! <laughs> All right, I'm gonna look this up. I really hope it's the same guy. <laughs> oh shit! We're only at the top twenty. And it's also gonna be hard because this is where a lot of like the best songs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're a part of it. <laughs> uh, so 20 piebald American hearts. This is an emo band that I am more surprised people don't know is political. Like they have lots of non-political songs, of course, but they have like a fair amount of like social political commentary in their songs. And surprisingly enough, their biggest hit is probably their most openly sociopolitical song great fucking song holy fuck like i love piebald and off kilter like just like this offbeat sense of humor that permeates like even in the music my favorite song from this album is long nights though Yeah. (laughs) We're nobody's robots, we're nobody's monkeys. (laughs) Not even in a bad way. Yeah, I love Piebald. And they are one of the bands where you can 
literally see going through their material that they are hardcore kids. Like mm. a lot of a lot of these types of bands, you have to like go back to their ex members of lists to see that they are hardcore kids. But like when you go back to like sometimes friends fight, it's it's extremely obvious that they were like homies with Caven and homies with Converge. Like yeah, Kurt Ballou produced a couple of their albums. Yeah. Yeah, I'd stop. Um, I'd stop listening to them at this point, but I was a I was a, a very very big how sometimes friends fight fan. Yeah, I I love pretty much all their material up to and including this record, but after that I kind of fall off. Um, anything else on Piebald? Nope. All right, this is number nineteen, and this is also the song that I am most pissed that it's placing. <laughs> Should be I top would, ten to you. I I would literally switch the song with number one. <laughs> I think this is the yeah. In a historical sense, this is the emo song. Um, Indian summer, angry sun slash uh, woolworm. If we're uh, hewing to the apparent wishes of the Indian summer members, can. <laughs> If anyone can make an argument to me that this is not the definitive emo song, the most emo song that's ever been committed to tape, um, I will quit this podcast right now. <laughs> oh wow, you're you're gonna you're gonna be super sad when I show you this strictly ballroom song. <laughs> so you're gonna have to quit your podcast. <laughs> but um. But this definitely would have should have been like you know top five. I, I, I at least I I don't know. Um, I mean it's good it's in the top twenty, but honestly like this is this is where it all comes from. Like all of the like anything that's like screamo or or Midwest emo, I, th I think comes yes. from this. Like and uh, it was it was a huge huge influence. To the point where, like, even Jimmy Eat World name drops Indian Summer in interviews. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah, you, you, their their reach is is so is so far reaching. Like, it it just yeah. their their influence is so far reaching. It's crazy. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, they've become like one of the only bands of this era and style of emo that like Midwest and emo pop kids like can think to name, which is a shame because I'd appreciate if more people like. Shout it out, Native Knot or whatever. But I also think that everything they put out was fucking phenomenal. So I'm at a, I'm in between a rock and a hard place on that one. Uh, um, and I think it's interesting that they are followed by number eighteen, Radio by Christy Front Drive, because Christy Front Drive are another absolutely quintessential band in the development of emo. I was surprised by how far up this is, though. Even though I'm they not, are quintessential, I feel like yeah, I, 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 I'm not. I, I think that they took the, I think that they took the poppiness of emo and really made it, made that, uh, made that a a part of the, part of the genre. I think they they did that by themselves mostly, and you know, like the Jimmy Eat World wouldn't have been who they are without them, and. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it, and the the whole Midwest emo thing wouldn't have been what what that was without Christy Front Drive's um, influence. So I, I think this is. I, I guess I think I'm this, surprised like, because it's like they aren't like the second band name out of someone's lips when talking about Midwest emo these days. I think it's one of the first um, <clears throat> YouTube videos that pops up if you type in like Midwest emo. Um, <laughs> honestly, on YouTube, like literally, on which YouTube. actually matters. <laughs> yeah, I I think that Christy Front Drive were masters of putting together these gorgeous uh, dual guitar parts and just having them like uh, to make it weird. Just having like the guitar parts like caress each other, like just kind of like pushing them to further and further boundaries. And the songs don't like explode the way that mineral songs do, but they kind of coast along to like this swelling point, and then the tide goes back down, and the song's over. But yeah, perfect song. I love Christy Front Drive, and I said this before, but Christy Front Drive, Boys Life Split, literally 
perfect record. Yep. Um, if you haven't heard that, please listen. Yeah, one of the best splits. Yeah. 16. Because <laughs> I want to talk about 17. <laughs> what is going on uh, with that's that? That's fine. But... Man. Yeah, that, that shouldn't have been there. That's That, that was a... <laughs> that was a that was a huge mistake. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is up there with the Bay of Pigs for the biggest mistake <laughs> in American history. <laughs> Stray Light Run, existentialism on prom night is what we're talking about. Yeah, for those that aren't staring at the list, uh, I literally would rather there be like a like a static lullaby song here. I'm dead serious. <laughs> I I would rather stick stickly by attack attack be seventeen on this list than <laughs> existential well, by, by straight light run. Number sixteen, Jawbox Savory. Uh, Kim Collette is one of my favorite bass players of all time, and that I just wanted to say that I don't know. It's this is a great this is a great record uh, and savory. I mean, definitely more post hardcore than emo i would say but it was at the at the time it was very influential on on emo and like the the way the song way songwriting was progressing yeah um 1994 was a cool year um primarily because of dookie uh in that you could see jawbox sunny day real estate and shutter to think uh get mtv play to some degree yeah um and i think it's really a, a like a crime in major label history that this record caused jawbox to kind of dissolve and i think it's uh, been vindicated in history because it's the best jawbox record and david anthony kind of threw me off in the middle of the sentence because he compared the song to Blind by Corn. <laughs> okay. Sure. Why not? <laughs> I did, yeah, that ruined my whole train of thought. <laughs> yeah, great song. Uh, the biggest Jawbox song and probably biggest emo or emo adjacent song of 1994. I think this did get uh, more radio play than Seven, if I'm like looking at looking at charts correctly. Yeah, great record. So uh, number I, fifteen. Hold on. I when I saw Jawbox was on this list, I was like, okay, I've heard them as emo adjacent, and then I typed them into this band emo when this list came out, and it says that they're not an emo band, and I thought it was kind of surprising that like uh, that we're in the top twenty and still like being like, why is this on here just for some of these songs? <laughs> I don't know. I get it. I get it. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I get Jawbox, but not Stray Light Run. <laughs> Jawbox, yeah. Yeah. Jawbox definitely more than Stray Light Run. <laughs> um, do we want to move on to 15? Yeah. Okay, because this is a fucking huge one. 15, the promise ring, is this thing on? I think that Nothing Feels Good has gone down as the emo album, right? This this is the this is the album that anyone who moves past My Chemical Romance or Fall Out Boy listens to. It's because of Andy Greenwald. It's the hook for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's also so immensely catchy, like from the fucking get go, just boiling over with energy and passion and hooks. Um, and something that I think the Promise Ring excelled at was. Uh, especially because on this album, the production on the guitar is so thin, it allowed the bass to kind of carry the melodies. And th I think that makes these songs a lot stronger than they would have been if the if the bass was buried or if the guitars were a little heavier and harder. Yeah, the bass the bass definitely propels the songs. It's it's really um, that's a huge part of this album, and one of the one of the best bass players at the time too. Like mm -hmm. just. Like and live too, just he, it was flawless all the time. It, it was amazing. Oh yeah, because um, they, they would play these songs like at two x speed live. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and it was, but yeah, the, this the, I think this could have been top five too. I I would have I would have put uh, I would have put something off. Nothing feels good in the top five. And 
in a in historical sense, I think it's kind of a shame that the Promise Ring got so big because uh, in retrospect, they overshadow like Ten Boy Summer and None Left Standing, um, like the the bands that the Promise Ring kind of uh, sprouted out of. In addition to Captain Jazz, who, of course, because of the Kinsella connection, are very well remembered. Um, but mm-hmm. I think uh, Promise Ring are the inventors of emo pop, and the fact that they came directly from emotive hardcore is very significant. Yeah. With that said, are we ready to move on to number 14? Yeah. Damn, it was so long <laughs> since we talked about this band. <laughs> <laughs> Q without the E, cut from the team by Taking Back Sunday. Uh, this is the Taking Back Sunday song, obviously. Yeah. This was my favorite song for like 15 years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I think if uh, you have never tried to sing like all of the vocal lines simultaneously, uh, then you are not real emo, personally. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this was the one that... that uh, we always covered or like when i was like starting to play shows and i was like 15 like we, you know we'd go play like a coffee house or something and like i had to have a rendition of cute without the e like on like at, at re- like ready to go at any point it's just one of those it's just anthemic yeah it's a big karaoke song too like yeah. um seth you do not like taking back sunday at all correct no i don't I don't. I don't get it. Um, yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, but I do think that this record in particular had, along with Bleed American by Jimmy Eat World, uh, it was the biggest like watershed moment for emo or emo influenced bands kind of leaking into the mainstream. Um, yeah, it was it yeah. was huge. I I I remember it. I remember it coming out, and I was. I worked at a, I worked at Amoeba Records in San Francisco at the time. It was a it was a very it was a big record. I just I just never never was able to get into it. Um, you know what? That's fair. Um, and also, I respect that uh, because Taking Back Sunday is inadvertently responsible for uh, <laughs> "Cute Is What We Aim For" and <laughs> "All Time Low," uh, that <laughs> anyone would hate them. <laughs> Also, shout out to uh, this part of the write-up, influenced by a combination of The Promise Ring, The Get Up Kids, and Jay-Z. <laughs> <laughs> Emma's been uh, doing real good with these write-ups, but I do want to dispute that. I think uh, one of the... I think the biggest influences on Taking Back Sunday are Lifetime, yep. uh, 80s hair metal, and uh, Flavor the Flav. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on Taking Back Sunday? All right, uh, thirteen. The Get Up Kids, action and action. I don't know why. I there, it should be something and at mile. Like there's, if it's an if it's a top one hundred email list, I don't see why it's not a song off of four minute mile. mile. I think That's, that this really, album has almost gotten on course with four minute mile or surpassed in popularity. It's always been more popular than four minute mile. Yeah, uh, it's more popular, but it's less emo. <laughs> no, yeah, sh- oh, okay, sure. okay, sure, sure, yeah. Even if you were going to pick uh, an earlier Get Up Kids song from back when they were more emo, I, I do think this list would have picked like one of their like poppy outliers from their early years, like um, Don't Hate Me or my personal favorite, uh, Mass Pike. Yeah, Mass, yeah, Mass Pike. Mass Pike, would been, Mass Pike would have been a great choice. Would have been a great choice. That's a four minutes of perfect pop music. Um, but even on something to write home about, this isn't the song, right? Like that's holiday. I don't know. I don't know. Or I'll I'll catch you. I'll catch you if you're going for that. Ian Ian did point out the halftime breakdown, which makes this song more in the running than any of the other tracks on the than the than some of the other tracks on the record. Yeah, I mean it is a it is a great song. I'm not. I'm not complaining about the Get Up Kids. I think they were a fantastic band. Also, they were really fun to see live. Like it was just a bunch of like daddy emo peeps, yep. like half singing along. Like, did you see them on their last tour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was cool. Yeah, and uh, 
Matt was super sweet and nice on stage, and it was just like really pleasant. Um, anything else on uh, the Get Up Kids? You can you can tell we're trying to like eat lunch too. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, twelve. Rainer Maria. Planetary. I, I I feel like they should have just had the first Rainer Maria track here. Oh. Um, uh, yep. I think. Uh, I don't think historically. Like, I mean, this like not as a knock against Rainer Maria musically. I mean, in like a historical relevant sense. I don't think Rainer Maria deserved two songs on this list. No, I. They, but I mean, I think that I, I think that. The, the the previous track could have been number twelve, uh, and that would have been fun. Yeah, yeah. God damn it, we were talking about my heart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's quintessentially an emo line. But I don't also don't have anything bad to say about this song. I'm like just um, trying to think but, of like I like I love Planetary, but like it's 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 just kind of sticks out next to like Action and Action, and spoiler spoiler spoiler. <laughs> as like a top 20 best of all time um especially coming above god damn it that indian summer track <laughs> yeah you know I, yeah. I, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of tracks that it surpassed that it didn't need to however coming up on number 11 we have the first of two songs by another band i'm not gonna say that this band necessarily doesn't deserve to have two songs this high up uh, but I, I do think it's a, uh, it's a little redundant to not pick one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, if I was gonna pick one or the other, I would pick this one, Eleven, Sunny Day Real Estate, in Circles. I think this is uh, the better of the two. Even though my favorite Sunny Day Real Estate song is "The Blank Is Where the Stairs," this is a massive song, like crushingly big song. Yeah, um, and this was this was also this was also on MTV at the same time as as Savory, and it was a it was a it was a a big deal. And I I think that it gets uh, it gets kind of hard to parse Sunny Day Real Estate's influence uh, on modern emo because they've been talked up so much as like the definitive 90s emo band and people kind of jump straight from Rites of Spring to Sunny Day Real Estate when they talk about the history of the genre. Even though I don't think there's any bands out there right now that sound like Sunny Day Real Estate. I kind of wrestle with that too. And like some people listen to it and just think it sounds just like 90s rock. Yeah. Even like when you go to like forfa.com, uh, the write up of Diary is like, oh yeah, this sounds like Foo Fighters, Smashing Pumpkins, Alterna Rock. Like, yeah, I told Andy, I told Andy he was wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is, it is wrong. I don't think it sounds like, you know, kind of 90s arena rock, uh, in that sense, but I do kind of see where he's coming from uh just because sunny day real estate was so fucking big like at the time they were the biggest selling record on sub pop next to bleach by nirvana like that's insane yes yeah, nuts and they sunny day real estate were the first emo band to play late night <laughs> yeah so <laughs> their their influence is undeniable but yeah great great song um, I do think Sunday Real Estate should only have one song on this list, though. Uh, number 10 is Puzzling. Very puzzling. Yeah. 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 This is one of those other bands that has been... This is probably, like, the most recent band that's just been written into emo by journalists. Like, you don't go into a record store and see people talking about this band as an emo band. It's, yeah. stri it's strictly uh, a journalist thing. Uh, number 10 is Hop Along Tibetan Pop Stars. I don't think this song uh, has anything to do with emo, like either historically or musically. Joe Reinhardt doesn't like, even play on the song. He recorded yeah, it, yeah. but he exactly. doesn't play on it. There's, there's not even there's not even Aldrin on uh, <laughs> Connect. <laughs> and I I like the end of this write up. Arguably, Hopalong never wrote another emo song again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, you think? <laughs> yeah, sure. Arguably, they never wrote an emo song to begin with. Yeah. So, but I mean, like, 
I don't know, maybe in 10, 15 years, we're, we're going to sound like total idiots because uh, Hopalong has been absorbed into the emo canon. But no. as of now, this doesn't make sense. We're going to sound like idiots because we're insufferable nerds. But Oh, yes. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm not saying that we're not going to sound like idiots. I'm just talking about the reason. <laughs> when this album came out, who are they touring with? Like, I don't know this. I don't know the answer to that. But like, when this album came out, no one cared about it really that much. I mean, there there was a the, the Philadelphia the Philadelphia scene at the time was great. Like, there were. Yeah. I mean, they were they were probably just playing with all those rad Philadelphia bands coming coming out at the same time. That was that was a, a really really good scene. But I mean, a lot of it was not emo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and even like. In an audience sense, uh, I know a lot of emo kids do like Hopalong, but the band became like Vice Noisy Core, you know? Right. So yeah, I, I don't really have much to say about their inclusion, um, but I, I think that the number 10 spot on an emo list could have gone to so many other bands. And there's been some out-of-nowhere picks, like even this high up, but... I mean, they could have put like a Dahlia seats on here, <laughs> you know, yeah. if they if they were gonna, if they were gonna put like a like a crazy good song from an underrecognized band, they could have put like a Dahlia seat song or fuck like Shroom Union. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's there's so many other like obscure picks that they could have put here, um, rather rather than going with Tibetan pop songs by Hop Belong, which is a is a song that there are karaoke versions of on YouTube. <laughs> Speaking of karaoke versions on YouTube, number nine, My Chemical Romance, Helena. <laughs> We're all in agreement that there only needed to be one My Chem song on this list, and it maybe could have been much lower, right? Yeah. 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 Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I think Helena's a great song. Like, definitely a close second to I'm not okay in terms of like popularity from that record and in general I mean I feel like those are the two like biggest songs besides Welcome to the Black Parade I'm surprised I didn't choose Welcome to the Black Parade yes yeah. yes I've um, been thinking that the whole time like yeah. that, I mean yeah that to so many people in America is like emo they don't go any further than that so if you're if you're gonna put like the most mainstream of mainstream emo songs up here uh you could have picked, like, Welcome to the Black Parade. I would have sacrificed, like, I'm not okay, and then just thrown Welcome to the Black Parade at number nine, probably. I don't, I don't know. It's it's hard with a band like My Chem. I feel like every they're just like what people think of as emo. It's like obviously you're, they kind of had to throw in at least you know more than one, but. And I don't want to shit on them because I think they are a phenomenal band, um, and their place in emo is undeniable like for better or for worse you know yeah um i wish that more, i just wish that more people at the risk of sounding like a i don't know hipster or some shit but i just wish that like more people would delve into like a little bit further into the discography because i think there's so much more to be enjoyed yeah. other than you know those most five popular songs yeah i i brought you my bullets you brought me your love is uh, a top ten album, yeah. like of the two thousands. Like it's a full on ten out of ten album. I think Not every single song on this. there. No, exactly. I think every single song is so good. Yeah. You got any my chem takes, Seth? No, no. You guys, you guys have covered it pretty well, <laughs> and I, I, I appreciate it, and uh, I like some of their tracks, but I, I'm not uh, definitely not a someone to speak on it. I just wish okay. that the write-up um, for this piece defended it instead of just describing a song that everyone has heard. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. I agree. I appreciate that it's followed up by uh, number eight, Algernon Cadwallader, some kind of Cadwallader, though. Uh, and you could have picked literally any fucking Algernon song. Yeah, there's like here, and it ten of them that would have been super fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, the the chorus on this one just puts it just puts it a little bit over any other choice, I think. So that makes it makes it's a good, very good choice. I'm mm-hmm. surprised I didn't pick Spit, yeah. Spit Fountain. 
personally. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I feel like Spit um, Found is like by far like so much more popular than any other song that they have. Yes, that's true. It was it was it was also one of the only ones that was on Spotify for a while. Right. Yep. Like you couldn't like you, you there weren't any other Algernon releases. Kyle, what was your tweet? Frog spit knuckle tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a long ass time ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that that was an that was an early hit for us. <laughs> Good tweet. Good tweet. Yeah. I do now have an Algernon tattoo that is a tattoo of the person Algernon Cadwallader. Oh, fun. Oh, okay, word. Yeah. Um. Yeah. The 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 guitar playing on this track, like the the uh, twinkly parts that that are after the you know the oh man it's taking me over and then the twinkly parts that come after that are like just they hit so hard it's it's me so memorable like just like the way he plays the way he plays guitar on this track it's it's amazing yeah, yeah. i do uh i do want to metaphorically pour one out for every diy kid who's put his guitar in open tuning and has to deal with somebody coming up to them after the set saying yo your band sounds a lot like algernon Cottawaddler. <laughs> the band sounds like algernon tadpole dude it's fucking <laughs> awesome <laughs> happens every single time <laughs> I have two more things to say on Algernon uh, first is I personally would have put If It Kills Me I think everyone has like their own pet Algernon song that they would have put here uh, second is uh, one time at work there was this uh, there's this person who was like oh yeah I really like math rock so I was like oh then put on Algernon in the back um, and see if you vibe and she listened to it and then came back to me up front and said, I don't think I'm ever going to listen to that band ever again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Honestly, like, that's kind of fair. I feel like they are a little bit grating at some points. It's kind of like snowing in the sense that, like, you kind of have to listen to it a few times to really kind of get it if you're not already into the genre. Yeah. Um, so now we're at top seven, which makes it impossible for us to drop out. So <laughs> gotta, we got to just plow through. Yeah. Sorry to everyone who wants to eat lunch or for anyone who needs to pee. <laughs> um, <laughs> number seven, writes a spring deeper than inside. My literal only gripe with the song is the fact that it is one like, the one that comes after it. <laughs> like, yeah, just switch on. these two and I would have been completely fine. <laughs> but is, is, it, is it possible ever in, in the history of talking about emo to not talk about rights of spring? It shouldn't be. No, yeah. I mean yeah. it's right. It's right up in there in the copy pasta, is it not? Yeah. Yep. Um, and yet, and yet, there are so many people I know. I did a poll once on Twitter. Does anyone listen to Rights of Spring? And it was fifty-fifty. Like fifty percent said yes, fifty percent said no. And literally, someone said, "I think if you, I think no one listens to Rights of Spring, and you only say you do to sound cool." And and that hurt me very deeply because I. I genuinely love <laughs> like th this band changed everything for me like in the sense of being a hardcore kid and like relearning what hardcore could be capable of I remember listening to this band for the first time just like hoping that I connected with it and that I liked it and listening to it and feeling so relieved that I didn't have to act like I loved it because I genuinely loved it <laughs> right Right. However, one small gripe, I would have picked a different Rights of Spring song. I would have picked End on End. That's it. That's, that's my favorite gripe. That's my favorite yeah, one. Yeah, I, I would have done. I would have chosen End on End or or Deeper Than Inside. I think those are both both very yeah. solid. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, I, I I do wish it was not uh, behind the next song. <laughs> yeah. I I'm also just glad they didn't pick for want of. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Coward. Because that, that one would have been a coward pick. Because that one has the lyrics that are kind of extremely like I don't know, cringy. I mean if I had to pick one Rights of Spring song with cringy lyrics, it would be theme. If I if I started crying, would you start crying? Um uh no, mostly because for want of like sounds less like emo than every other song in this album for want of just sounds like kind of like a heavier joy division song to me interesting yeah uh and then number six literally like i love paramore i love this band 
and I'm not even upset that they're on this list, but it is a little bit no. It's a lot of bit very annoying that they are one spot ahead of Rites of Spring on a list of best emo songs of all time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're, more rule, they're more rule. They're great. I, yeah. I, I just don't think that they should be in the top ten. Also, uh, do you think they picked That's What You Get on purpose just to not have to write about misery business? Yeah, yeah I absolutely definitely. think that that yeah. was yeah, that was the choice. <laughs> Even though misery business is much better than That's What You Get? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, they, Paramore has such a strong discography uh, that they could have picked any song from their first three or four albums and been well within their rights to defend it. But instead they went with like probably the weakest Paramore hit. Do you think that out of all of these mega popular emo bands like your Fall Out Boy, your Panic, uh, do you think Paramore deserves the highest spot out of all of them? I don't. Um, uh, I think Taking Back Sunday probably does, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah probably. probably. I, I I definitely don't think Paramore should be on number six. That's kind of cra- yeah. That's kind of crazy to me. That's that's it's a little cray. <laughs> and with that out of the way, number five, Sunny Day Real Estate seven. They could have they could have put this uh, at number seven on the list, and <laughs> that would have been fine too. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it, this is a this is a great song. Uh, does not need to be on here if In Circles is already on here. I mean, I would have chosen seven over In Circles myself. Yeah, absolutely. But... Or you could have picked like Song About an Angel. Like, yeah. That's my favorite sure. song on that album. Yeah, those first three songs on on that record are just so inextricable from what emo is to a lot of people. You could have picked any one of them. And if you were going to put more than one Sunny Day Real Estate song on here, just fucking go for Broke and for Play Stray Light Run with Song About an Angel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're all in agreement that Stray Light Run shouldn't have been on this list. That's, yes. That's, yes. That's, yes. That's, one of the, that's one of the main takeaways from this sesh. <laughs> I um, feel like Brad Nelson's getting the biggest lashing in this episode. Yeah, and I feel bad because he's a good writer. He does talk about still life. Still life could have been on this list. Yeah, I don't know. They they could have they could have taken Stray Light Run off and put on Still Life. I don't, you know. Yeah. Put on put on oh. book on you instead. I would have been so stoked if they put a song about love instead of Still Life, or sorry, yeah. instead of uh, Stray Light Run. Would have been a perfect pick. Number four. Uh, this is actually the song that I've gotten the most people coming to me and saying, "Why the fuck is this on here?" Sweetness by Jimmy Eat World. I'm I'm trying to bring myself to argue why it shouldn't be on here. But any Bleed American song would be fine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they could have put Bleed American. They could have put the middle. They could have put a praise chorus. Like A praise chorus would have been ballsy and great because it has, I mean, it directly Davey. shouts out Davey. <laughs> and it also shouts out Kickstart My Heart. <laughs> um, Sweetness, I think, is actually like a stronger song than a, a praise chorus. Um, but it's not as concise and anthemic as the middle um so i feel like this is actually like the weird pick of a bleed american song to put on here and i also don't think it belongs this high i think uh if you were going to put two jimmy world songs on this list i would switch the bleed american song with like a clarity song if you had to put a jimmy world song this high up yeah and i i i, I think bleed american would have been a better choice as well still though great fucking song you cannot you cannot fuck with the call and response vocals. Uh, I appreciate that this this write up talks about uh, Bleed American like functioning as uh, the middle ground between new metal and teen pop. Um, as, well, because it was authentic in a way that both of those genres weren't, um, and it had like some aggression, but it also had catchiness and accessibility. Um, and it was emotionally honest and sweet and real in a way that uh, the post-9-11 world probably really needed at that time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, the, the middle and sweetness were both gigantic radio hits. Like, I think a lot of people weren't expecting Jimmy World to have, like, two radio hits. Uh, yeah. Like, right after each other. 
the first time I heard emo was at some gathering at my house and we were listening to the radio and the middle was on and one of my dad's friends was like, oh, they're playing emo on the radio now? And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> are you saying your dad's friend was like an OG gatekeeper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, he, he was like kind of young. Like, my dad was probably like 40 and this guy was like 30 and he was like playing like fucking RPGs on his computer and stuff. That's disgusting. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, come on, at least like get some imported JRPGs and play it on your Sega Saturn. Fuck. <laughs> uh, um, are we ready to move into the top three? I'm I'm more than ready. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Seth. <laughs> no, I meant I meant in an excitement way, not a not a uh, let's get this over with way. <laughs> Number three, Captain Jazz, Little League. Like, yeah, yeah. Captain uh, Jazz absolutely deserves to be number three. Yeah, I really enjoy that Emma acknowledges that a lot of Tim Kinsella's lyrics just kind of sound like adventure timey. Like that makes perfect sense. <laughs> um, and I think that uh, Captain Jazz kind of embodied uh, a sort of sweet, almost toxic innocence, um, because. I mean, you know, that, that Tim Kinsella doc that Vice did kind of goes into detail about uh, how harmful the experience of Captain Jazz was for the members of Captain Jazz. Mm -hmm. um, but the the way that the, the songs themselves play out, uh, you can't really hear any of that tension. It, it kind of comes across as like a messy yet cohesive masterpiece. And I mean that for every song that they ever wrote. And it was they, they they were like actually doing something new like this yeah. was you know they, they were like this was uncharted territory that they were going into and it's it's just so it's it was so well put together yeah i think the fact that like every third band like nowadays uh or maybe not nowadays but back in like the mid to early 2010s sounded like a captain jazz ripoff kind of obscures the fact that literally no one sounded like Captain Jazz at the time and no one sounded like Captain Jazz for like a good 10 years after they bro after they broke up like rivaling Braid in like ahead of their time category the band that they but, always shout out in interviews them as in like Captain Jazz's crew is Gage who is from that area that I have not yeah. been able to find anywhere on the internet oh, Gage, yeah Gage are amazing yeah Gage, Gage are very good are yes. they on YouTube um, yet or anything because like three years ago uh, they weren't they're probably there's probably yeah there's probably some videos on YouTube. Um, yeah. I know there's. I a got them on Soul Seek. Um, however, the other band that they that they shouted out uh, as an influence in I think an Exclaim piece that I read about them, like probably the biggest influence on their songwriting. Uh, at least that's what Victor said was uh, Jane's Addiction, which is crazy to me. <laughs> that's but bad. I can kind I can kind of hear it. Like I genuinely can hear it. <laughs> but. Captain Jazz, I'd argue, has more swagger than Jane's Addiction ever did. Like, can you imagine Jane's Addiction, like, doing anything like their take on me cover? No. <laughs> yeah. No, Jane's, Jane's Addiction is completely humorless and, like, just too self-serious. And Captain Jazz had this, like, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't whimsical because whimsy sucks, but it was, like, fun in a... Yes. In a, Fun with a purpose, like the uh, Highlights Magazine used to say. I wouldn't say not whimsical, because I don't think it sucks, but it was whimsical without being precious or cute, you know? There we go. I yeah. mean, they were, like, not even 18 at the time, or maybe they were 18, but, like, yeah, they just had that energy about them just being fucking, like, wide-eyed. And now that I mentioned whimsical without being precious or cute, like, yeah, the Adventure Time comparison continues to make perfect sense. Mm. <laughs> um, you ready to move on to the top two? Yep. Yeet. Oof. Number two. Oh, uh-oh, Seth. We might, <laughs> we might have an argument on our hands. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, Jawbreaker, Accident Prone. Correct. I'm going to say it. Correct. Like, I'm gonna say uh, yeah. I'm gonna say correct. If you're gonna, if you're gonna put Jawbreaker in the top three, Accident Prone's the the track to do it. Um, this isn't this isn't my favorite Jawbreaker song. <sighs> my my favorite Jawbreaker song is Jet Black, and my 
I still don't have any tattoos because I'm a fucking normie, but I do really want a uh, funny, like a funeral on my wrist. Uh, cause that lyric speaks to me, but I do think accident prone is like the jawbreaker track and it, it wasn't at the time as near as I can tell, but because of Spotify, I think it has slowly become the jawbreaker track. <laughs> yeah. Seafoam, Seafoam green is my favorite jawbreaker song, but I, for the purposes of this list, I think accident prone is perfect. What does it say about me that my favorite one is fireman? This says that you, um, that you like to rock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, t- do you consistently have nightmares, Kyle? <laughs> oh, for for, <laughs> for, for, for extended weeks. periods of time. For, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Dear You is probably still my favorite album of all time. So I, I wouldn't be able to argue with any Dear You songs. Yeah, I can't complain with Accident Prone. This is a correct pick. And for, and uh, for for those who haven't looked at the piece, they they have a. A photo of Jawbreaker and the bass player is wearing a Jawbreaker yeah. shirt. Yep, which is pretty, which is pretty great. <laughs> yeah, that's up there with like Trey Cool from Green Day wearing a Green Day Nimrod shirt <laughs> <laughs> on the Nimrod tour. <laughs> also, I I have seen a picture of Kurt Cobain wearing a Jawbreaker shirt, which is unspeakably cool to me on so many levels. Yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah. Toured, they toured. They yep. toured. They yeah. toured. Um, there was a great. Uh, there was a great uh, tour diary from Blake about that. The, the yeah, wipers, the uh, wipers couldn't make it, and so Jawbreaker did like I think it was five dates. Yeah, there is a, an amazing piece on uh, one of the Jawbreaker Nirvana shows from Ben Weasel, actually. Yeah, because I uh, think one of the shows was in Milwaukee. Yeah, and uh, Bobcat Goldthwait opened, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. Yeah, Jawbreaker, uh, untouchable band deserving entirely of their place in the emo canon i don't care what anyone says okay so we're at number one and i do just want to thank uh seth and collins both of y'all for going on this journey with us for what has been almost uh seven hours now <laughs> <laughs> you put that's, it a, that's an e- that's an emo work day <laughs> yeah uh this has been uh really really fun and i think if uh people get anything out of these episodes it's going to be maybe like a a more concrete sense of the history of emo as a genre and like historical context and maybe some cool fun facts that they didn't know um because ultimately i don't think the purpose of this list was really to critique it um it was just to use it as like a discussion point for emo where where it's been where it's at in 2020 and how all the pieces of the puzzle fit together uh so thank you guys for helping us do that yeah no thanks for having us yeah absolutely so we're not going to talk about the song right no it's it's, it's done (laughs) yeah it's done uh thanks everybody uh uh, we were we were never meant to talk about the song (laughs) hey no that was was too give it to me no i'm upset uh but also i get it one of those things where, like, I don't understand where you're coming from, but I respect you anyway. I mean, I it with Ian being involved in this list, I knew he was gonna put this at number one. Like, there's there was no possible way he was gonna allow American football to not be the f- number one choice out of a hundred songs. Like, yeah, that's yeah. just that's just that's where his his tastes lie. His tastes yeah. lie. yeah, that's it. And, and, I, th- I think like, this is the starting point for a lot of for a lot of kids. So like it makes sense to me. I mean, honestly, I think the that this song and this record in general is is very like recognizably mainstream for being like not a super, you know, popular um, genre in general. Uh, I mean, what yeah. is it? Lil Nas X like posted on Twitter like the yeah. American Football House the other day. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, that's that's cra- it's crazy to me that like this is it's a very recognizable. I think it kind of just encapsulates a lot of the pieces of the genre that people like, you know. And um, you know, say what you will, but it's kind of the case. It's yeah, it it is really weird to me because even though American football is has nothing to do with emotive hardcore musically. It's impossible to talk or think about emo in 2020 without looking through the prism of this song uh, because of 
it, the, the stature that it has somehow accrued over the years. And I really, I think there's been like some sites that have tried to do like an oral history of uh, American football and how they came to be like the definitive emo band to so many people. But I really would be interested in like some kind of history of how American football got like rediscovered and in retrospect crowned the kings of emo mm -hmm. uh, in like the kings of a genre that they never adhered to. They played like six or seven shows before they reunited. Yeah, and the, and the when when that album came out, it was it was like um, it was well received uh, amongst a, you know a small group of people, but it was it didn't uh, it didn't quite make a, a as big of an impact as it seems now when it came out. Like I, I, you know, a lot of a lot of us who were very into the Kinsellas we're we're very into it but it it didn't it didn't start growing in um in its influence until until later and that was very interesting to see yeah, yeah um if i had to point to one single culprit it would be tumblr like yeah seriously that house is so infinitely rebloggable and mm -hmm. i think tumblr also facilitated the rise of a lot of like bedroom pop acts and I think that like the general songwriting aesthetic, especially of this song, uh, fit in with a lot of that stuff. And then when you tie that together with, oh yeah, these guys used to be in, or Mike used to be at least in Captain Jazz, who are, you know, I I would say uh, to a certain degree the the biggest broken up emo band for a long period of time. Um, it just kind of like snowballed to the and then 2014 changed everything um 15th anniversary of the record and then they put out that uh what was it the uh the music video for never meant posthumously like that was like an officially sanctioned music video for a band that hadn't played a show uh in 15 years um and it blew up caught on like wildfire and it's just slowly grown even since then, to the point where I, I think that American football are now like synonymous with emo. I have mixed feelings about that, but I can't like really talk shit on American football the way I have on the show in the past uh, because they are really important to so many people, and I don't want to like take that away. <laughs> yeah, I think like sonically, just like what they invoke is just that like kind of nostalgia like high school sort of things that a lot of people associate the genre with and then obviously the album cover just being like iconic and inspiring so many others i mean how many house albums are there like uh, like a hundred thousand you know um mm -hmm. yeah i think it's just important to like recognize their influence and i you know i think that I mean, if American football came out today, like, would people like it as much? Like, I have no idea, but you got to respect, like, what it kind of inspired. Yeah. A lot of people haven't heard anything that even sounds like this because they don't hear twinkly guitars in in different tunings until American football sometimes. So, like, I don't know. I think uh, the intro for a lot of kids was uh, Canadian softball, you know, world-renowned <laughs> fan Canadian softball. <laughs> I know, like, that's, I think, like, when that video came out, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, I think I've heard of, like, I think it's, like, an American football, and then you look it up, and for a lot of kids, it's just like, oh, yeah. It's just a nice, like, bridge between, like, even though it shares nothing with pop punk, like, I feel like there's a bridge between, like, your basic, like, I like state champs and neck deep, and then you're like, oh, but I want to delve more in, what do I listen to? And people just say American football for some reason. No, the fact, the fact that you brought that up actually reminds me, I think one of the biggest reasons is Real Friends, the band Real Friends, like, because they openly shout out American football, like, on more than one of their early EPs, I think. Okay. Yeah. So I think that that's the, that's the pop punk connect. And mo modern baseball, too. I think people kind of just, like, g Googled, like, oh, bands that sound like modern baseball and somehow found their way to American football. Um, and connected it because of the names, you know? 
<laughs> I mean, I was aware of American football because I was listening to Owen. Right, right. And um, I, I listened to Owen for like four years before I ever listened to American football, but I still knew him as the guy from American football for some reason, probably because of Last FM or something. The Owen version of this song, though, is so good. Oh, yeah. Does anyone have more thoughts on Nevermen or this list as a whole? No, but I had a good time talking about it with you. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun. I think it's I think seven seven eight hours. It's been fun. Seven hours. Yeah. And I do have to give this list props. Like there was a lot of picks that I was not expecting, especially from an outlet like of this size. But shit, it introduced me to Sarge. So yeah. <laughs> the one, the one band. <laughs> yeah. Um. Thank you guys so much. Uh. Thank you, Kyle. Um, of course. Thank you, thank you to our listeners for waiting through this. Um, yeah, it's been the 100th greatest emo songs of all time, courtesy of Vulture. And I think we'll see you all soon.